Oh, All I right. see just the recording. Okay, now it's going. I'll let Juliana know. Okay, we're good. The meeting's live. Brief. Good morning and welcome to the April 11th Public Design Commission meeting. Um, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can find uh, in the description below the video, you'll find links to the agenda, with, which has links to the public presentations and a link to the testimony sign-in form and uh, instructions for how to give public testimony. And if you've signed up to testify on a project on the public hearing today, please join the Zoom when the project uh, you're testifying on is announced. After, if you're watching YouTube and you join Zoom, please be sure to either close the YouTube channel or mute that so that you can reduce feedback. And also once you're in the Zoom meeting, please be sure to rename yourself so that the name on your video matches the name that you signed up with. That will help us find you uh, when you're, it's your turn, to, your turn to testify. Thank you. Signe, we can begin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Signe Nielsen. I'm president of the Public Design Commission. Uh, we're going to uh, begin the meeting with a roll call to confirm commissioner attendance. So when I call your name, if you would please say here. Phil Ahrens. Here. Ken Seth Armstead. Here. Lori Hawkinson. Here. Deborah Martin. Here. Karen Keel. Here. Susan Morgenthau. Here. Ethel Sheffer. Here. Meryl Tisch. I believe she's on the phone. Um, and Mary Valverde. Here. Okay. So um, now let us commence um, the public meeting with a vote on the consent agenda. Uh, today we have items number 28064 to 28091. The staff has noted that there are no recusals. Uh, does anyone uh, have a recusal that was not noted? No, uh, for the record, there are no further uh, recusals. Um, I will now call for a vote. Um, commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote. Uh, please state your vote for the consent agenda. And if there are any items you uh, uh, wish to abstain on, please uh, state that, that number. Um, Phil Ahrens. Phil, oh, you're muted. Approval. Uh, Ken Seth Armstead. I would like to abstain from items 28079, 28089, 28090, and I would like to approve all else. Thank you. Uh, Lori Hawkinson? Approved all. Deborah Martin? Approve all. Karen Keel? Approve all. Susan Morgenthau? Approve all. Ethel Sheffer. Approve all. Meryl Tisch. Approve all. And Mary Valverde. Um, I would like to abstain from item 28096 and approve everything else. Thank you. Um, and uh, for myself, uh, approve all. Uh, so with that, uh, the consent agenda um, is uh, passes. Um, so we are now moving on uh, to the public hearing. Carrie, do you wanna? Um, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so again, I'll just repeat, if you're watching on YouTube and you want to give testimony on this project, please join the Zoom uh, meeting now. You can find below the YouTube video, you can find the instructions on how to join YouTube, as well as the agenda and uh, links to the uh, presentations. And if you've signed up to testify, please be sure, uh, please rename yourself in Zoom to make sure that the name of your video matches the name that you signed up for. Thank you. 
Thank you. So for this first item, Vice President Phil Ahrens is recused uh, and he will now leave the meeting. So this uh, item, uh, 28092, installation of a mural at MoMA PS1 in Long Island City. So per standard procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony, if any, will be heard and followed by our deliberation and vote. Um, so now, uh, Elena Gonzalez from PS1 will give an introduction, and then Nani Ba Chapel, one of the artists, will also present. Um, I've given control of the screen to Janelle. Um, so, um, can we please unmute Elena? Thank you. There we go. And then Nani also. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning all, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate your presence and your listening. I am Elena Kerosen Gonzalez, an assistant curator at PS1, pronouns are she, her, and I work primarily in collaborative projects and long-term partnerships with neighboring organizations. I've been at PS1 for about two years now. So I program Homeroom, the Courtyard, and the Public Plaza. In the audience from PS1 are Janelle Thompson, Manager of Strategic Partnerships, and Jose Ortiz, our Deputy Director. Joining us also in presenting is Nani Chacon, one of the mural artists, who will talk about the project with us all today. So I'll talk about the artists, the collaborators, and then Nani will get into the process of the work itself. So the artists we selected for this process, um, if you can go to the next one, Janelle, are truly community-centered in both their process and images. We have a closed curatorial process at PS1, meaning we engage in rigorous research, conversations, listening sessions, and through that, we selected three artists with a track record of working collaboratively in public space, outdoors, and in community spaces outside of museums. This is really part of a larger way of working at PS1, where we are integrating community participation and collaboration into all we do. So the artists we selected really demonstrate this. First, Tatiana Faslalizade is an artist based currently in Brooklyn. She's a painter whose work ranges from the gallery to the streets, using visual art to address the daily oppressive experiences of marginalized peoples. Her street art series, Stop Telling Women to Smile, you may have seen it all over the city as Wheat Pace, addressi addresses sexual harassment in public spaces. In 2019, she was the inaugural public artist in residence for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Next, Leika Nuna Yawar is a public artist and multi multidisciplinary storyteller based in Newark, New Jersey, and working across New York City. His work is best known for large-scale community-based murals, intricate portrait paintings, and multimedia projects that center the complex narratives of immigrant, Black, Indigenous, and racialized populations. These artists also think about graffiti and street writing in their practice, which is important because we did want to acknowledge and be in dialogue with a site of five points across the way. So as much a part of the mural as the artist, are the collaborators. We don't consider them participants. We really consider them collaborators. So we selected three groups with whom we have worked with across other projects to work on the mural. So these are community groups embedded in other programming through Homeroom, through the Plaza, through public programs. First is Transform America. That's a group of members of Queensbridge houses who live and work in the area. They do food distribution and different community organizing initiatives. Secondly was Make the Road, a national immigrant rights organization headquartered in Queens. Many of the, of the collaborators from this group actually built all these new buildings around the area. They feed the workers and they transit through here. And lastly, we worked with Tecumseh Caesar, an artist and cultural organizer who was born and raised in Astoria, just down the street from PS1, and actually went to PS1 art summer camp as a child back in the 90s. Um, so with him, we organized representatives from the Matitnikok and Shinnecock nations, understanding that these perspectives were important to center in the construction of this mural. 
So I'll pass it along now to Naniwa, who can talk more deeply about the process and the workshops with the collaborators. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with all of you. My name is Nanaba Chacon. I am currently in Albuquerque, New Mexico, so thankful to be here. Um, and I am based out of here as well. Uh, I, we began this project um, in 2020. And the work that myself, Tatiana, um, and uh, Lekwa do is all community and base work. Um, it's integral to the work that we do. And we see doing work this way and creating work this way as a way to bring communities together um, and have them a part of the art making process. Um, it's a way to see themselves reflected in the community. Um, and we always see this work as being collaborative. The work that we create as muralists could not be conceived without the input of community members. Um, and, and the way and could not be could not be created without community members and their lived experience and the reflection upon the landscape is integral to the way that the work is created. Um, we also see the importance of this work um, being that it is 100% accessible. Um, all of creating murals and having them exist in the public landscape is important to the integrity of the work. Um, it becomes independent and it's also supported by uh, it, educational and artist institutions. So for this project, we began at the beginning of 2020. Um, we were interested in the community response um, during and after the pandemic and saw the events of 2020 um, as an integral pivotal point in society. And we wanted to recognize that collective experience. Um, we wanted to, we were interested in how those working on the ground and the communities were infected um, by these events, but also how they envisioned and wanted to see the future here, here at that time, but also um, working into the future, being that they were all groups and people who were very integrated and working in their communities through this time. Um, we began this process of engaging with this content by hosting a series of workshops. Um, we thought of these workshops as being more like listening sessions where we would kind of take the backstage and allow just a platform and a space um, to kind of unpack all of the content that was there also to to give a free expression a free recollection of um, their experience how they were working in their communities how they had seen their communities before and how they want to envision it after um, the workshops were uh, i would say they were intimate they were given they were giving um, we were there to, to listen and, and find ways that we could imagine, dream together, um, also kind of hold space for what we had gone through collectively. Um, and, and also to learn, to learn and, and provide a learning space for, for this content and for us as individuals. Um, part of the process was beginning to talk about, um, we, we used certain prompts. Um, one was what happens after the fire. We liked the symbol and the, I guess the layers and content of questions that were a little bit open-ended that gave the viewers and response time to contemplate them in a metaphorical form, um, but also to give very 
um, in-depth answers on how they interpreted that and then how we could have a response also as artists and community members um, to unpack some of this imagery. Some of the other questions we asked as prompts was, what is home? What provides safety? And what makes us feel safe? All of these questions um, worked as ways that we could generate imagery and generate content for the mural that we are creating. Uh, the mural content that is up for approval is a uh, portrait of Kelly Dennis. Um, as part of the workshops, we also took photographs of the groups as groups. We took them individually. Um, we also took photos of their family. I, part of our process, um, part of our process is that it's very important for community members to be recognized, to be seen, to be reflected on and share the exchange of, of the art making process um, in a public space. So the mural content that we had chose for this one is um, both a, it is a portrait um, and it also brings in some of the imagery for um, the questions that we asked. It is a photo um, that will be painted of Kelly Dennis. Kelly Dennis is a Shinnecock tribal attorney. She is also one of the only female tribal council members for Shinnecock Nation. Um, we felt she, she held a very important role in her community. Um, and slightly behind her is a fire. We look at the symbol of a fire as being both re renewing, um, but also kind of teetering on connotations of um, on its destructive qualities, but also um, its renewal qualities, um, its, its uh, ability to, and it's used in ceremonial ways, and it's also um, used as like a, a place to restart. Before her is a, Morning, a morning glory plant kind of emerging from her shadow. And we had chosen this to kind of show the duality of um, destruction, but also rebirth. Morning glories are a very, very common plant. They are a hardy plant that is grown everywhere in Queens. Um, we had seen them kind of, you know, growing up through the sidewalks, through, going through, growing through fences um, while walking through the neighborhood. Morning glories are a plant that has a lot of resilience and adaptation. Um, we thought it was a very beautiful metaphor for to hold these concepts that we have. It is also a, um, a flower and a plant that um, opens and begins to thrive only when it's in the presence of water. So with this piece, we really wanted to show kind of the complexity and dualities of this content without giving, um, giving some space and some room for um, conceptual content to emerge. Thank you. And um, just to say about a bit about the location, this is located at PS1, of course, right in Long Island City, Queens, a few steps away from the Court Square Station. You can see here across the way from the former site of Five Points. And we are also have been working with the Department of Transportation, who've been great partners in helping us steward this plaza, which is truly for everyone. It's been amazing to see people taking their lunch breaks there, um, folks in the community walking by to do shopping at Trader Joe's, resting and sometimes even happening upon public programs that we've been engaging in with partners like Fortune Society pictured here, um, which is headquartered just down the way on Northern Boulevard. So it's a, a heavily trafficked area. And I think with the plaza, it's a place that people are finding um, more and more is the sort of place of respite within this neighborhood, which as we all know, has, has really few public spaces and spaces for pedestrians. So we really see it as an ongoing 
invitation to engage with us in these programs and to remember that PS1 is always free for New Yorkers as well. Yeah, so hoping there to, to break down the, the bleakness of that wall. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, presentation. Um, Carrie, has anyone signed up to uh, uh, testify on this project? Let me just double check. No, Signe, no one has signed up. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say thank you for that presentation. Um, thank you for the uh, really extraordinary thought that you have put into this uh, process. And on a very personal note, many, many, many years ago, I was the landscape architect for PS1. And uh, it gives me incredible pleasure uh, to see you bringing the museum out uh, and enlivening that, that public space, which is uh, needed. And thank you, DOT, also for enabling that space uh, to be brought into the uh, usable public realm. So um, commissioners, any uh, comments or questions for the, um, the presenters? Uh, hearing or seeing none, uh, we will then, um, take a vote uh, to approve uh, this proposal and um, with no caveats other than my own, which is thank you. Um, so we will take a, a roll call. Um, so if you could please state your uh, vote, um, uh, approve, abstain, uh, or uh, reject. Um, can I just ask a quick question? Oh, of course, Lori. Sorry. Just um, what, what kind of, because you're painting it on the, this is just a technical question. I don't know if this is too early to ask, but um, as an architect, what, what, how are you painting onto the concrete? What, I assume that all that's um, just the details of that, because it's right at the front door, very permanent, all that. Sure. I'll let Nani chime in about the process. Sure. Um, the so this mural is discussed to be temporary. Um, the mural itself will integrate the concrete of the wall that's existing, um, and then between that, there will there will be some kind of um, I want to say like an, a clear undercoat. So one that'll act as a primer. So it's not like all the paint is not totally absorbed into the concrete, um, but also it allow for easier removal when the time comes for this piece to be, um, for it to transition. Thank you. Um, all right, let's um, uh, proceed with the vote. Uh, Ken Seth Armstead. Proof. Lori Hawkinson? Approve. Deborah Martin? Approve. Karen Keel? Approve. Susan Morgenthau? Approve. Ethel Sheffer? Approve. Meryl Tisch? Approved. Mary Valverde? Approved. And myself, approved. So it is unanimous. Congratulations uh, uh, to the team. Uh, and we. I look forward to seeing its realization. Thank you. Um, so much. Thank and now Commissioner uh, Vice President uh, Aarons will now rejoin the, the meeting. Thank you, so, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you.
Um, so next on the agenda are items 28093, 28094, and 28095 at the Manhattan Detention Complex in Manhattan. Removal of immigration on the Lower East Side of New York by Richard Haas uh, and Upright by Kit Yin Snyder and the installation of an interim Sally Port and Bail Payment Center. The artwork removals were presented together in one presentation, will be, excuse me, presented together in one presentation, followed by a separate presentation on the interim Sally Port uh, Bail uh, Payment Center. Uh, after the two presentations, public testimony will be heard, followed by commissioner deliberation and a vote. Uh, please begin. Hi, I've given control to Dora. Um, is Amelia Michaela who will give a brief introduction. And if I can just remind anyone who's in the meeting now and which would like to give testimony on these projects, please be sure to rename yourself so that your name matches the name uh, that you signed up with. And if you're watching on YouTube and would like to give testimony, please join the Zoom meeting and sign up uh, to give testi testimony, excuse me. Uh, the link to that form is in the description below the Zoom, sorry, below the YouTube video. Thank you. Do you have control, Dora? Yes. I think Michaela is gonna start. Great, thank you. Hi, um, good morning, commissioners. I'm Michaela Metcalf, Director of Project Excellence at DDC. Um, today, we will be presenting three proposals related to the dismantle of the Manhattan Detention Complex. As you know, dismantle is required to move forward with the construction of a new borough-based jail, jail facility on the same site. The first two proposals include the removal of two existing artworks, Immigration on the Lower East Side of New York, a mural by Richard Haas, and Upright, a pavement design by Kit Yin Snyder. The third proposal is related to the installation of an interim Sally Port structure at 100 Center Street that will allow the Department of Correction to maintain critical operations at the courthouse while dismantle and construction work proceed at the Manhattan Detention Complex site. We are here to demonstrate our commitment to addressing the concerns related to the artwork removals that were raised by the commission when they were last presented at the February 14th meeting. We would also like to express that the Sally Port proposal being presented today has been refined in response to community concerns raised at the Community Board Land Use Committee meetings on January 13th and February 7th. The proposal integrates windows, reduces the overall height, and incorporates artwork. The interim Sally Port features <clears throat> temporary reproductions of Immigration on the Lower East Side of New York by Richard Haas and Upright by Kit Yin Snyder. We have worked with Richard Haas and Kit Yin Snyder to integrate the artwork design with the Sally Port design, and both have given their approval of the concept as shown. To be clear, these temporary reproductions are not in lieu of the long-term recreations of these artworks that will be explored as part of the design of the new borough-based jail facility. At this time, I would like to introduce Dora Blunt, Public Art Manager at DDC, and Kendall Henry, Assistant Commissioner of Public Art at DCLA, who will present the artwork removals. Then we'll hand it over to Kathy Wong of Lero, who will present the Sally Port design. Thank you. Dora? Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I'm Dora Blunt, Public Art Manager at the Department of Design and Construction. I'll be joined today by Kendall Henry, Assistant Commissioner of Public Art at the Department of Cultural Affairs. We will be presenting a follow-up on the removal of two artworks at the Manhattan Detention Complex site operated by the Department of Correction in order to respond to concerns that were raised during the February 14th PDC meeting. <laughs> Just a reminder of the artwork site. The Manhattan Detention Complex site is located at 124-125 White Street in Lower Manhattan at the intersection of the Chinatown and Tribeca neighborhoods and the Civic Center area to the south. MDC is comprised of two towers that are connected by a bridge over White Street. These buildings are slated to be dismantled and replaced by a new borough-based jail facility. This is a plan showing the existing artwork locations at MDC. 
Today we will be looking at the two artworks that cannot be salvaged from the site. The pavement designed by Kit Yin Snyder on White Street and the immigration on the Lower East Side of New York mural by Richard Haas. The other five artworks will be salvaged and the removal and storage of these pieces was approved by the commission at the February 14th hearing. Just a reminder, DDC is managing two separate projects at the Manhattan site, one to dismantle the existing MDC buildings and one to design and construct the new borough based jails facility. The dismantle project received notice to proceed at the end of December 2021, and that design build team is currently mobilizing to begin the dismantle work. The project to design and construct the new facility is currently in procurement and is expected to begin early next year. DDC's mandate is to complete the four new borough-based jails facilities in time to meet the city's obligation to permanently close the jails on Rikers Island in 2027. This is an overview of the process of developing a plan for the artworks at the Manhattan Detention Complex site. The Department of Design and Construction, Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Department of Correction have been working together on a plan for the care of the artworks at the MDC site since 2019. Our goal from the beginning has been to save as much of the artwork on the site as possible. We began this process by conducting research and gathering all available information on the artworks. In the PDC and Percent for Art archives, we were able to find some architectural drawings, black and white photos, and color slides showing the original condition of the artworks. We were able to track down the artists to notify them of the dismantle project and establish a dialogue with them in the planning process for the artworks. We were in touch with both artists by February 2021, and since then have been consulting with them and providing them with updates as the planning process progressed. We hired professional art conservators to evaluate, research, and document the artworks. This work established the feasibility of salvaging each artwork. The art conservators also provided specifications for safely handling the artworks, which were included as requirements in the RFPs for both the MDC dismantle project and the new BBJ facility project. The extensive planning process we undertook was essential to ensuring that both the MDC dismantle project and the new BBJ facility project included provisions for the services that will be needed for the artworks. This careful coordination and preparation is reflected in the RFPs for both capital projects. Next, we developed an artwork conservation plan based on our research and the feasibility of salvaging each artwork and presented it to the community board in December. Today, we are seeking PDC preliminary approval for the removal of the two artworks that unfortunately cannot be salvaged because they are embedded in the site. Since February, we have taken additional steps to prepare for recreating these two pieces, which we will describe in the coming slides. Soon we will begin the very careful step-by-step -step removal process for the artworks to be salvaged and temporarily stored as approved by the commission in February. This work will be overseen by Stephanie Hoagland, a professional conservator from Jablonski Building Conservation. Once the salvaged artworks are placed in storage, we will return to PDC for final review. This is an overview of the approved plan for the five artworks that can be salvaged. The plan for these artworks includes three phases. The first phase has already taken place and included thoroughly documenting each piece in situ. In the next phase, these artworks will be carefully removed and stored in custom crates while work proceeds at the MDC site. When the construction work on the site is nearing completion, these artworks will be reinstalled at the new BBJ Manhattan facility or at an alternative site. All reinstallation proposals will be developed in consultation with the artists and will only proceed as approved by PDC. Kendall? Good, good morning, everybody. So this is an overview of the proposed plan under consideration today for the two artworks that cannot be salvaged. For the first step, these two pieces will be thoroughly documented in C2. We are currently in the process of completing this documentation. Next, we will salvage and store representative samples of the original artwork materials for reference. Then, in consultation with the artists, we will be developing a proposal to recreate the artworks in new materials, either at the new BBJ Manhattan facility or in an alternative site. Each of these steps is expanded on in the upcoming slides. We'll also identify opportunities to temporarily display reproductions of these artworks while construction work is on ongoing at the site. 
This will be shown in the interim Sally Port presentation immediately following this presentation. The temporary reproductions are intended to enhance as enhancements to the Sally Port design and as a way for these pieces to be enjoyed by the public in the interim. In no way is this proposal meant to replace the ongoing work of identifying long-term options to recreating the artworks as we discuss, as we are discussing here. The first step, as mentioned, is extensively documenting the artworks in the original concept, design, and installation, and also how they exist today. This work will inc has included the following, researching and reassembling all available information about the artworks, consulting with the artists on how the artworks are fabricated and installed, recording the artist's preferences for what they would consider as potential options for recreating the artworks, professionally photo photographing the artworks in situ, hiring professional art conservators to reproduce to produce reports on the artworks. These reports include detailed descriptions of the artworks and their condition and specifications on how each piece should be handled, confirming as built conditions against original design drawings to ensure each piece can be accurately recreated as the artist intended, creating electronic copies of original designs and drawings for contemporary uses and organizing and archiving all the materials as they're available and accessible in the future. For Upright, the pavement designed by Kit Ian Snyder, the artwork documentation has included professionally photo photographing the artworks from above and at ground level. The original plaque will also be salvaged and stored. The artist has indicated that the Chinese characters on the plaque are important to her concept. The mural, Immigration on the Lower East Side of New York by Richard Haas has been professionally photographed. Once obstructions currently in front of the mural has been removed, additional photographs will be taken from straight on. The, the mural panels will be photographed both individually and as a group. The original plaque for the mural will also be salvaged and stored. The original blueprint drawing for Upright from 1988 has been verified in the field against as built conditions and new CAD drawings have been created. The new electronic drawings has additional dimensions detailed that were not specific on the original drawings. We have also borrowed Richard Haas's original scale maquettes for the mural for, the, for documentation purposes. Each one has been professionally photographed and scanned at 2400 DPI, which is the highest resolution available. With the artist's permission, these scans and photo, photographs can be used to, repro to reproduce the artworks dig digitally or in print. Moving on to saving samples of artwork materials. Samples of each material use in existing installations of these two artworks will be salvaged and stored. These material samples can be used for reference in, future, in the future when recreating a design in consultation with the artist. For example, for upright, samples of the red and black asphalt block pavers and the pink granite bands will be saved. For the mural, at least one sample of panel six and one sample of another panel will be salvaged and stored. The reasons for this is that panel six was painted in 1997, while the other panels were painted in 1989. So the, color of, so the colors of the panels were aged uh, at a different rate. Additionally, another sample will be saved for the artist at his request. Next, we will continue the planning process to recreate the artworks either at the new BBJ Manhattan facility or an alternative location. Once the design builder from the new B BBJ Manhattan facility is on board, they're required to study and propose placement options to recreate the artworks. These placement options will be re reviewed uh, by the artist uh, for input and approval. As part of the design process, in, cons in consultation with the artist, we may consider options for recreating the works in a different scale or with different materials to better integrate the artworks within the context of the new facility. Throughout the course of the new facility project, the design team is required to consult with the artists on any decision regarding the treatment, display, siting, or installation of the artworks per the RFP. Design services, as well as construction of any necessary site preparations, require required of relocating or recreating the artworks in, are included in the design builder scope as per the RFP. 
And of course, PDC review and approval will be required for all artwork relocation or recreation proposals being implemented. Thank you, Kendall. Um, so as just described, once the design of the new facility begins, we will be working with the design team and artists to study options for relocating the salvaged artworks and recreating the other two pieces as part of the new site design. Design is currently anticipated to start in early 2023. We will present the proposed plans to the community board before proceeding to PDC conceptual review. Once the artwork relocation concepts are approved and the artwork designs are further detailed, we will return to PDC for preliminary review during the design phase. During construction, artworks approved for relocation will be restored before being re reinstalled at the new location. In addition, artworks that were approved for recreation will be installed. The artists or their representatives will have the opportunity to oversee the restoration or reproduction of their artworks and the installation of these artworks. Once the artworks have been installed, we will return to PDC for final review and approval. That concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for your time today. Next will be the interim Sally Port presentation by Kathy Wong of Lira. Kathy, you're unmuted, but your audio doesn't seem to be working. Can you guys hear me? Yes, that works now. Oh, there was a lot of windows open. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Oh, hold on, I have to unmute something else. Kathy, you're oh. muted again. If you can un accept the, the request to unmute. How about now? Yeah, that's good. I'm sorry about that, you know, the technical difficulties. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Katie Wong from Lira Architects and Planners. And oh, we just lost your sound again, Kathy. I'm really on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear okay, you. I'm so, so sorry. Uh, so one more time. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, I, my name is Katie Wong and I'm from Leo Architects and Planners. And today I would like to share our vision for the interim Sally Port under the Manhattan Jail Dismantle Program. But before I begin, I would like to share the um, short definition of what the Sally Port is uh, exactly. So the Sally Port is the entryway that consists of a series of doors and the gates um, to securely transfer person in custody from one area to another. Next slide, please. So the Art Deco style criminal courthouse uh, and detention complex does We lost you again. Yes, I don't know why I'm uh, cutting off uh, one more time maybe. So the Art Deco style criminal courthouse and detention complex designed in 1938 by Cobert and Myers, now called South Towers and the North Tower designed by urban architects in 1990 is located downtown between Center, Baxter Street and Hogan Place. Next slide, please. The proposed area for the new Sally Port is in front of the New York County Criminal Court at 100 Center Street. Next. Uh, on this slide, the blue dash line represents the perimeter of the Sally Port and the connecting corridor. This corridor connects Sally Port with the existing uh, courthouse building. The gray area above indicates North and South Towers, and those buildings are scheduled for the dismantle under the jail bills program. Next slide. 
Uh, in the next few slides, I will represent the correlation between the criminal courthouse, north and south towers, and also the existing sally ports, which are serving these three facilities uh, today. This is the view looking north to the corner of the Center Street and Hogan Place. Next one, please. This is the view of the last segment of the courthouse building with the shaded area showing the ten detention complex uh, behind. Next one. Uh, here again, this is the unfast view uh, of the last segment of the courthouse uh, where the interim sally port uh, will be constructed. Next one. Uh, so there are three op uh, operational sally ports in the existing facilities. One, uh, two accessible from the center street and one from the Baxter. Also, this picture showed the existing street uh, curb cut uh, currently used by detention buses and which we are going to remain and reuse uh, in the same configuration for the new sally port. Next one, please. This is the center street looking south. Next. So to transfer uh, to safety transfer person in custody, we will create the connecting corridor using the existing door located near the north entrance of the courthouse. The original bronze door will be removed, uh, preserved and stored in a DCAS uh, secure facility for future reinstallation. Uh, and the new detention door are going to be installed in the same place. Next, please. This is the view of the existing courthouse uh, and the south tower um, connecting bridges. So we have two on the third and the fourth floor, and those bridges are scheduled to be dismantled as shown here. Next one, please. This is the view of the existing sally ports um, from the inside. Next one, please. This is the site plan showing criminal courthouse in relation to the south and north towers. This is the existing condition. Next, please. And in this site plan, um, uh, um, this is the extent of the proposed work. So the north and south towers, the connecting bridges uh, in unmute myself, uh, existing bridges um, and the existing sally ports are scheduled to be dismantled between 2022 and 2023. Next one, please. The blue area indicates the proposed location of the interim sally port in front of the courthouse. Next one, please. And this slide uh, showed the extent of the construction fence around the north and south towers. Next one, please. Um, this slide is pretty complicated because it's a, um, it's a, a logistic issue. So DLB personnel will guide the buses into the new Sally port as shown on this traffic uh, plan. This pattern will allow the bus driver safely maneuver uh, to the Sally port gate uh, using the same street cut uh, carp um, as we have now. Uh, it was estimated that approximately 12 to 12, uh, 15 buses daily will be scheduled to transport person in custody to the existing courthouse uh, from another facilities. Next one, please. So this partial plan showed the existing condition in front of the courthouse building where the new Sally port is proposed. Uh, this area contain, ex uh, con contain existing um, planter with two small trees and the shrubs and now flowers. Next one. Uh, and finally, the, the detailed floor plan of the proposed interim sally port. So the design scope for the Manhattan Jail Dismantle and the Swing Space Design Build Project includes the construction of the interim sally port in the center on this slide. The officer boot 24 hour, 24 seven uh, officer boot on the left hand side and the bail payment center show here um, on the right. The structure of the design um, is designed to meet DOC strict requirements and provide the secure access to Manhattan Criminal Courthouse for DOC and the uh, uh, NYPD vehicles uh, transporting person in custody from another facilities. Next one. Uh, the roof of the new facility is constructed from the tension grade mini mesh, so the whole structure uh, has a uh, its light in its appearance. Uh, the materials also allow the passage of the natural light into the existing DOC offices located on the first floor. Next slide, next one, please. 
uh, the existing planter will be removed and all original elements uh, like the granite stones shown here, the railing uh, at the stairs and the bronze door, which I will uh, explain in the next slide, will be removed, uh, protected and stored in the gas secure facility for future reinstallation. Next one, please. As I mentioned before, uh, all original elements will be restored and uh, restored and reinstalled in their previous location. Here, the bronze door. Next one, please. Uh, the two existing bridges uh, connecting South Tower and the Criminal Court, one on the third and one on 12th floor, are scheduled to be dismantled. Next one. After removal of 12th uh, floor bridge, the uh, exterior wall opening located on the south elevation of the existing courthouse will be infilled uh, to match the original Art Deco design. The third floor opening will be temporary in close, uh, allowing the connection between the courthouse and the new detention center. Next one, please. This slide shows the partial west elevation of the north entrance to the courthouse building. This is the existing condition. Next one. The design of the interim sally port, as shown here, obligated to speak as quietly as possible. The, material, the materials which I will present you later are selected for their light appearance and ease of the construction and dismantling. The colors and finishes has been uh, chosen to respect the tone of the granite base of the existing building and also overall volume of the program area is visually reduced by the simple, simple articulated wall between the public space and the uh, contain program. Next one, please. And that's my favorite. Uh, Sally Port West Elevation will incorporate the reproduction of Mr. Uh, Mr. Richard Haas' immigration of the Lower East Side uh, of New York. Uh, these murals are from 1989. Um, the art pieces will enhance the public experience, uh, creating a unique outdoor art gallery and will provide interesting element to the existing uh, streetscape uh, for the pedestrians. The future artwork appearance will be developed in consultation with the artists, as we mentioned in the presentation before. Next one, please. This is the north elevation for the, uh, of the courthouse and the current Sally Port uh, scheduled to be dismantled. Next one, please. Uh, on this slide, you can see the officer boot and the main uh, gate to the Sally Port. Uh, the, considering the rise in crime in New York City lately, this 24-7 uh, security boot will provide as much needed police presence and the surveillance to, the, to this neighborhood. The new sidewalk width, as you see here, uh, will be three, uh, 13 inches to, to 13 feet to two inches, which is still greater than the typical uh, 12 feet wide uh, New York sidewalk. Next uh, slide, please. Here, the existing elevation, south elevation of the criminal courthouse and the north entrance to the building, the current condition. Next one, please. The bail payment center here shown on the left is a ballistic glass storefront providing daylight as well and uh, uh, visibility of the occupation, uh, while the frosted interlayer uh, provides the privacy for the users. Uh, at the exterior wall of the proposed connecting corridor on the right here, uh, will incorporate temporary artwork uh, uh, of the current uh, pavement design on the White Street by Kitty and Snyder. And I, I will present more in, in detail this amazing work on the next slide. Next, please. So Kitty and Snyder art, uh, art upward, uh, upright it was introduced to the public in 1992. The pattern is the pictogram of two Chinese character meanings, uh, upright and uh, rightness. Uh, similar to Richard Haas, all decision about the appearance of the artwork will be in consultation with the artists. Next one, please. Uh, here is a few uh, sections to the Sally Port. There's a long section. Next one, please. Short section, um, um, security boot and bail payment center uh, seen from inside. Next one. So the next few slides uh, will show the integration of the proposed Sally Port with the courthouse building and incorporation of Mr. Richard Haas and Ms. Kit Snyder uh, artwork. Next one. Here's the main entrance uh, for the vehicles and a 24-7 security officer boot. Uh, this is the view looking south. Next one, please. 
the proposed Bay Payment Center and on the far right, uh, Kitty Snyder artwork. Next one, please. And this slide is actually interesting uh, because it's showing the size of Ms. Uh, Mr. Richard Haas uh, reproduction seen uh, from the pedestrian perspective. Next one. Here, uh, Ms. Snyder upright in front of the north entrance of the criminal courthouse. Next one. Uh, as I said before, the proposed materials are selected, were selected for the daylight appearance and ease of construction and dismantling. Uh, the colors and finishes have been chosen to respect the tone of the granite base uh, of the existing Art Deco building. Uh, when the nor uh, short uh, lifespan of the Sally Pot is over, the removal will re-expose the protected original finishes and will leave no trace to the appearance. Next one, please. Uh, for the reproduction of the art pieces, we have selected the high quality aluminum based vinyl film using UV ink uh, to secure the true uh, visual um, representation of the art over the lifespan of the Sally board. Uh, and then last week, we have ordered some partial prints in one to one scale, and those samples will be presented to the artist uh, for the review and approval. Next slide, please. And uh, this is our final slide. This is the, the metal panel samples placed in front of the existing uh, granite uh, building base. And that will be the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. And then uh, we're ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie, has anyone uh, signed up to testify? Yes. The first person on our list is Howard Hui. We will unmute Howard now, and everyone has three uh, three minutes. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Howard Huey. I am speaking today on behalf of Na Neighbors United Below Canal, NUBC, in opposition to the plan to remove the important artworks of Kit Ian Snyder and Richard Haas, including upright and immigration on the Lower East Side of New York. NUBC believes that the removal of these culturally significant artworks violates the law, including the Visual Artists' Rights Act, otherwise known as VIRA, and codified as 17 USC Section 106A. As the Public Design Commission may already be aware of, VIRA protects the moral rights of attribution and integrity and prohibits the destruction, mutilation, or other modifications of artworks on the circumstances which NUBC believes applies here. That would be prejudicial to the artist's honor or reputation. The quality, status, and caliber of artworks has been well established and over the last three decades and has won an award for excellence in design from the PDC. As acknowledged by the conservation plan, portion of Yin Snyder's and Haas's work cannot be salvaged. Despite the significant, significant value of these artworks, the plans are to dismantle and de-access upright and immigration to the low east side, uh, low east side of New York, which mutilates the art. The place reproductions of this artwork on the outside of the interim Sally Port significantly alters the art and, and portrays an artistic vision that is materially different from what was intended by the artist. Moreover, the sites where the works are located is relevant to the status of each work. As acknowledged by the conservation plan, Haas's work traces the history of successive waves of immigration in the 19th and 20th century to the Lower East Side in Chinatown. Haas intended his work to illustrate overlapping cultures at the site adjacent to the melting pot immigration communities of the Lower East Side. Removal and destruction of Haas's work from this site will destroy the relevance and caliber of the work. Without this installation, the timeline depicted by Haas's work will be incomplete and the painful memories shown in the artwork will lose their value. Yin Snyder's up, upright will likewise have no relevance once removed and destroyed. As acknowledged in the 21422 Conservation Plan, 
She stated, on the pedestrian walk under the throne, she will create a geometric labyrinth and colored pavers. The skies within the pattern will be the pictograms of two Chinese characters, meaning upright and righteousness. The residents of our community have, interesting, have interest in ensuring that public artwork, which depicts the history of our community and is culturally significant to Chinatown and is not mutilated or, or destroyed. The destruction and removal of the artwork sets a bad precedent for the, for the percent for art program. While the conservation plan purports to preserve the artwork, it fails to do so. We therefore object to the removal of the artworks. Thank you. The next person on the list is Nancy Kong. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I uh, wanna thank the commission for the time. My name is Nancy Kong, co-founder of Park Row Alliance. We represent a consortium of local community associations, residents, and small businesses in and around lower Manhattan. We have been involved with the borough-based jail since August, 2018, and participated in every neighborhood advisory council meetings, as well as public hearings. We continue to advise the city of the concerns related to the construction and destruction of the jail and its impact to the local community. The removal of the artwork, <clears throat> excuse me, and its destruction is another insult to the community. The Sally Port with its current design imposes another burden on the neighborhood and lacks consideration of the concerns of the community and most specifically in our public safety. We ask the commission to reject the proposals and request for more details and incorporation, incorporation of concerns and comments from the residents and community input. Specifically, the artwork should be preserved in a place to honor the artist as well as the community given its cultural significance. This project must be paused until the community has had ample opportunity to review and understand the various plans proposed related to the dismantling and rebuilding of the jail facility and to consider these art pieces and where they should go. The community decries any destruction and urges that none of the artwork be destroyed and there has to be maximum preservation and restoration of the art. The Sally Port needs to be redesigned to incorporate and be integrated um, instead of being imposing and blocking off more public access areas. We need more details as well as landscape designs. It cannot just be a massive box. More importantly, we have asked for alternatives to be reviewed to allow the existing Sally Port to be adapted and reused prior to committing to, its demolition, to the building's demolition. Even more importantly is the lack of um, the public safety that is, being, that is not being addressed. The city and this commission must review the crime rates of the surrounding streets for the past five years. You will see a steady increase in assault, burglaries, and, ex and even escapes from custody. There has been inadequate engagement on the design of the Sally Port, and this is another rushed project to destroy the community. We ask the commission to reject all three proposals until, until alternatives have been fully reviewed and vetted to, so to limit the destruction of our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next person is Carrie Colhan or Colhane. Rebecca, do we have Carrie Colhane? Yeah, Carrie, if you can accept the request to unmute, you should see a, a pop up. That work? Yes. Yes. Please okay. go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. And good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Carrie Colhane, and I'm an independent urban and architectural historian. I'm also the author of the Chinatown and Little Italy National Register nomination, and I'm currently completing a doctorate in architecture that examines the evolution of Chinatown's built environment since the 1870s. And for several years, years now, I, along with many others, have been concerned about the state of the public pedestrian plaza and the public artwork at the Manhattan Detention Facility, uh, which were designed by artists and landscape art architects and completed with public funds in the late 1980s and early 1990s. These projects were intended to soften the blow of the out-of-scale jail building that had been fought by Chinatown community members since the early 80s 
And it's hard to believe that the same fight now must take place all over again. And so to be clear, we're not talking just about artwork. We're also talking about the alienation of public space. Uh, the public art and pedestrian plaza with its distinctive pavers representing the characters for upright and righteousness was intended to better integrate this carceral behemoth into the fine grained streetscapes and pedestrian patterns of Chinatown. But almost immediately the bollards excluding traffic were removed by the Department of Corrections and uh, they commandeered the plaza and turned it into a private parking lot. So this community asset, this public asset became a private parking lot for the Department of Corrections. Uh, lines were painted on a public artwork and the DOC seems to have done this with impunity without ever filing for a change of land use. Um, and of course the PDC records show that these works were to be supported by a maintenance budget. And now we're being told that artwork has been uh, neglected to the point where some of it is unsalvageable. So uh, the mission of the PDC, of course, is to advocate for equitable design of public spaces. And the records of the PDC show that even as it was approving modifications to the pedestrian bridge as recently as 2015, it failed to hold DOC to account for defacing a publicly funded and commission approved artwork and its related landscape. And so any site visit by commissioners would have revealed the poor state of the plaza and its defacement. And in fact, I reached out to uh, former Executive Director Justin Garrett more about this issue in June of 2019 and received no reply whatsoever. So I feel that the state of the plaza really symbolizes the emptiness of the city's promises to Chinatown. And it really reveals the DOC to be a bad neighbor. So rather than removing the plaza and the artwork, these assets should be returned to the community in situ. And the DOC uh, should be paying to restore what they willf willfully neglected and damaged. No work on a new jail or site plan for this area should take place until the legacy of DOC's disrespect for the surrounding community is adequately addressed. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the list is, sorry, Diana Switage. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Diana. Hi, this is Diana. I'm testified to sign up under Fearless Girl and Tammy Meltzer, chair of CB1, is to testify on this item for CB1. Oh, okay. I have you sign up for this for both. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next person, which is Alice Blank. Is Alice Blank here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm testifying first on um, items 28093 and 28094, the art removal. And here I'm testifying on behalf of Community Board 1, um, as distinct from my testimony as a personal architect on 28095, which is the installation of the Sally Port. So let me begin with the art removal on behalf of Community Board 1. I'm vice chair of community board one. And um, for the record, please note that community board one did not receive the, pres the presentation of the art removal update that was provided here to PDC today. And our testimony is based on the February presentation. In December of last year, community board one voted unanimously with one abstention on a resolution opposing the removal of the seven pieces of public art currently located at the Manhattan Detention Center. There was resounding response from both community board members and the general public that there has been insufficient engagement and notice surrounding the plan for the art and the broader plans for the demolition of the two existing detention center buildings, which are inextricably, inextricably linked. The community board does not believe it is in the community's best interest to approve any removal and relocation of public art without a complete understanding of how the art will be incorporated into any new plan. To date, the community has seen no plans for the proposed new jail. At a minimum, the community board believes no approval should be granted prior to an assurance that the artists are in agreement with the plan, that they will be fully remunerated if the art is removed, and that the new plans for the location of the art have been reviewed and approved by the artists and community. The community board has requested that the current administration afford the necessary time to more carefully review any and all potential alternatives to retrofit either one or both of the existing towers and thereby potentially preserve the public space and the public art. The community board is again requesting this option be carefully considered prior to agreeing to any art removal and relocation plans commencing. Thank you. Um, 
I don't know if it's, this is if I should be <laughs> now. Uh, you can go ahead with the with the salad. But, okay, board. that's fine. Go I ahead. assume I'll get my three minutes back. <laughs> okay, so here I'm Alice Blank, and uh, I am speaking as an architect who lives and works in Lower Manhattan. For the record, please note the community board one did not receive the presentation on the Sally Port update that was provided to the Public Design Commission up today. I urge the Public Design Commission to oppose the design and construction of the Manhattan Detention Center Sally Port. Many architects, including Peter Sampton, the architect responsible for the renovation of the original criminal courthouse North Tower known as the Tombs, are entirely unconvinced that the existing Sally Port must be demolished and question why it cannot be used during the estimated seven to 10 year lifespan of the proposed project. The existing Sally Port is located in an approximately 30 foot wide space between the criminal courthouse and the Tombs Tower. The basement connection to the adjacent detention center building across White Street does not preclude for the demolition to be phased so the existing Sally Port could remain in use at street level while the North Detention Center building is demolished. There is a critical preservation issue here, which unfortunately continues to fall under the radar. The existing Sally Port is part of the Four Tower Criminal Courthouse Complex, which has been designated eligible for listing on the State and National Register of Historic Places and is considered eligible for landmarking by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. The Sally Port's existing patinated bronze panels set in the granite and limestone facades on Baxter and Center Streets form an integral part of the handsome Art Deco criminal court complex designed in 1938 and should unquestionably be saved. The proposed Sally Port, in contrast, an approximately 16 foot high by 40 foot long metal box is egregiously unsightly and will obstruct views onto the landmark eligible criminal courthouse from Center Street and will obstruct access to a third of the courthouse west entrance courtyard. I urge the PDC to ask that phasing of the demolition work be re reconsidered so that the existing Cat Sally Port continue to be used, avoiding the need for the environmentally impactful and wasteful demolition and the construction of an unesthetic interim structure estimated to cost an unconscionable $6.5 million. As stewards of the, and I quote, equitable and sustainable design of our public spaces and civic structures, the Public Design Commission should use this moment as an opportunity to urge that the entire landmark eligible North Tower of the criminal courthouse be preserved. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. The next person on the list is Tammy Meltzer. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning. In December 2021 and February 22, CB1 adopted resolutions opposing the interim Sally Port at the Manhattan Detention Center site. CB1 appreciates the applicants returned an updated proposal. However, the most recent proposals were never shown for public purview among the community board process. And the recent incorporation of the temporary um, of the existing public art at the site. The proposal still does not address many of the concerns that have been voiced by CB1 and the public for environmental impact mitigation, traffic concerns, and landscape architecture. The plan violates the BBJ points of agreement for the Manhattan site regarding the protection of existing trees. The presentation confirmed that the trees along the sidewalk will be not be preserved and furthermore did not include any landscaping at all. The Sally Port is proposed to be attached to the landmark eligible criminal court building and will remove access to approximately one third of the west entrance of the courtyard of the building and will significantly compromise views as Alice has already stated and will remain part of of the courthouse building west facade for a minimum of seven years. Our land use zoning and economic development committee pointed to many deficiencies of the plan, questioned the 6.5 million estimated costs and opposed the, proposed, opposed the proposed architecture of the Sally Port, which is neither contextual nor reflective of the local community. The committee identified critical need for open space in the area and that Columbus Park and Collect Pond Park are the only open areas directly located in front and behind the proposed Sally Port and MDC project. These parks 
will be highly impacted during this seven year period and CB1 believes it's imperative as much landscaping be preserved, new landscaping be incorporated into any project at this site. We asked for and did not receive the current presentation which would have allowed for public purview of the work to be phased in in a way to al allow existing Sally Port to be adapted or reused prior to committing to the demolition. The CB1 and members of the public feel inadequate engagement on the design of the Sally Port, rushed opaque design and review process did not allow for the public's right for engagement. Consistent with numerous resolutions adopted by the board, CB1 strongly opposes the current proposal for the interim Sally Port. We are not convinced that the existing building nor the Sally Port actually needs to be demolished. And more information and analysis should have been done to assess alternatives and to better understand why and how this is the best course of action in terms of both the Sally Port and the larger plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see that's the last person who is on our list for signing up for these projects. Oops, sorry. Uh, but I do see Regina Chan has their, would you like to testify on these? Hi, uh, I'm Regina Chan of United Save Chinatown, whose mission is to amplify the voices of local community to ensure that we as a collective can shape its future. What I've seen is an outcry from the community to, to try to understand the decisions of the city and why alternatives were not considered. While I understand the city is trying to achieve maximum public good, there's a clear lack of trust due to the history of how community engagement has been done. In addition to this, public safety has been a concern as the rise of anti-Asian hate has tripled. Uh, how will the design uh, increase both public trust and public safety? We ask the commission to reject this proposal until alternatives have been fully reviewed and vetted with means to educate the community as to why something was chosen. Rushing this process and getting this wrong will lead to the destruction of a community. I end my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And another person, Connor, I can't read that. Oh, Allerton. Hi. <clears throat> um, sorry, I, I, yeah, I signed up to speak on behalf of Council Member Christopher Marte. I can just give my testimony now on these applications. Um, so speaking on behalf of the council member, I urge the commission to oppose the design and construction of the proposed Manhattan Detention, Detention Center, Sally Port. There's overwhelming consensus among community members, local professionals, including Peter Sampton, who previously worked on this building that the proposed interim Sally Port is unnecessary and it only add to the disruptive nature of the project. Um, while the existing Sally Port can be preserved during a phased demolition process, it's also technically ineligibility of the criminal courthouse complex as a local, state, and national landmark. Um, it's an architecturally significant and cohesive component of the courthouse and only makes sense to preserve as such. I thus urge the commission to act in the best interest of both the local community and the local public realm and preserve the Sally Port as a landmark it deserves to be. Um, I also urge the commission to oppose the removal of public <clears throat> artwork on site and to give pieces, artists, and local community the respect, input, and collaboration that's essential to this process. I echo many of the concerns of Manhattan Community Court. One is they relate to the removal process and the lack of transparency therein. As long-standing art artistic elements of the public realm, these artworks deserve a public removal or relocation process uh, that they have to this point not received. The community has um, received up to this point as, um, as, as exclaimed by uh, members of the community board previously uh, little uh, to no information as it relates to this process, um, whether they will remain in the community, where they will be placed with, or any engagement on those questions. Um, I urge that this process be opposed until a full engagement strategy is put in place that centers collaboration between the city, the original artists, and the local community to devise the best and most respectful future for these essential public artworks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is, that's the end of the testimony as far as I can tell, Signe. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, commissioners, uh, questions for the, <coughs> excuse me, questions for the applicants? Okay, I have a question. Please. Oh, 
I don't know if, if Ethel, did you want to go first? No, you go ahead, Laurie. Okay. Um, so a question I see that, so initially someone first wanted to address the architect. So the west elevation of the Sally Port, um, we were, we had expressed an interest in um, daylight for this facility, this unfortunate facility, temporary facility. And I'm wondering, so what you're showing now is that you've replaced the Clara story with these windows where there was glass block previously when the, where the Richard Haas murals were. Sorry about my background. Yeah. Let me give control to Dora. I think uh, Kathy, we need Kathy to respond to that. Uh, that's correct. So the original uh, Richard has uh, murals uh, contained uh, the, picture the picture of the uh, window, which we are transferring right now to the real uh, life windows. So those uh, five elements in white on the bottom of the slide showing the the, exist, the, the new windows being proposed in lieu of the clustery windows. You unmute, Laurie. Those are windows with some kind of a frame around. I mean, is there a detail of that? How the, uh, we're how we're the plastic material meets the window and all of that. I mean, this is there for five years. So it's a long temporary installation. Uh, we will provide the detail of the windows if, if you request. Mm -hmm. There's no problem with that. And I also had a question because several of the community boarders at, uh, board members um, asked about the receiving this presentation beforehand. So I just wanted to check on that with, I don't know if it's DDC or who I should be directing this to, um, that they had not received the update on either the Sally Port or the artworks. Um, yeah, I can respond. Since February, that. since February 7th, I guess it was, is that right? Yeah, I can respond to that, Commissioner Hawkinson. Um, we did send the, um, uh, both presentations to the community board on April 7th last week. We sent it to the chairperson, um, sorry, no, the district manager, I mean. Okay. So I guess we don't get a response from that from the community board, but it, it was sent, okay. Since they don't get a chance to respond again. Um, okay. Th and then I had, um, so I also had a question about, because it was brought up by Peter Sampton, um, the use of the existing Sally Port. I know this is not to beat a dead horse, but just if somebody could review for me again, why that is, I know time is money and all that. I understand that. I understand that's why we're doing design build, but design build is also meant, because we just heard from Commissioner Foley earlier today that we're also meant to have design excellence in this. So I, I have a question about the um, exist, use of the existing Sally Port. So uh, uh, issue required for proposal uh, actually stated that the Sally Port needs to be located in the center street. And because I double question everything, I went to the building, I look at the uh, existing courthouse layout and it looks like First of all, the existing Sally Port conditions are really poor. I really feel sorry for the officers who work at that Sally Ports that um, the deterioration of the Sally Port itself inside is, is ridiculous. Uh, also, the, the site, uh, the sidewalk from the Baxter Street is too, too short to allow the installation. And, and underneath the existing Sally Port, we still have the south tower basement which are scheduled to be the dismantled so we have to do phasing uh, between the two sally ports and considering the two buses uh, being accommodated for for that function uh, we are not able to to salvage or use that space for for the new um, sally port also there were there were a few pictures sent by ddc 
um, personnel showing that actually on the center street there, there were before there was some kind of a structure just ex exactly the same location showing the columns the foundation and some kind of piers so it looks like in the uh, in the past there, there was some uh, building in front of that the specific location of the Sally port. I look at the historical uh, documentation and archives, I didn't find anything. Um, but uh, like I said, um, we, we did look into the locations um, to locate the Sally port in the, um, different spots or uh, to face the Sally port, it's the existing Sally ports, but it was not um, visible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, that was the have... easiest way. Uh, sorry, we also have Nina Gladstone um, from AECOM who worked on um, scoping this project. If she could be unmuted. I think I'm unmuted. Thank you. Um, hi, Nina Gladstone from AECOM. I think um, Kathy really did um, hit on all the points that there is um, space below the existing Sally Port that's part of the demolition as well as the bridge above it that is part of the demolition. So um, it would be uh, very difficult to keep the Sally Port uh, in operation during that construction. Um, one other point on the new Sally Port, um, the temporary Sally Port, in addition to the windows, the square windows that are on the facade um, as part of the um, design and the artwork, there is the whole um, top of the Sally Port is open, so they will get a lot of natural light from the top as well as from the sides. So hopefully that, that answers your question. If I can just jump in, commissioners, I, I wanna address some of the comments received from the public and just make sure that everyone's very clear about, or as much as we can about per, the PDC's purview. So the Public Design Commission, we don't have jurisdiction over the demolition of buildings. So if a building is stated for demolition, we of course have jurisdiction over how the, if there are artworks, uh, how the artworks will be removed. And of course we have jurisdiction over how they will be uh, conserved, stored and reinstalled. And the other thing is that we, we don't have any uh, power to weigh in upon landmarks that would be under the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We do not review construction procedures or construction staging, nor do we review uh, crime. Thank you. So I guess just my final comment would be, um, you know, I understand that we were trying to save you know, and, and trying to incorporate the artworks onto the piece, but I also consider the architecture to be part of um, an important public contribution in this very important location in New York City, even though it's temporary, temporary is five years is a long time, it's probably going to be more than that. And in all due respect, um, it, it, given the design build, I think that we could have um, been a little more design conscious in the building. Um, may, may I be recognized, uh, Carrie? Yes, go ahead, Ethel. Yes, thank you. Um, I I do uh, appreciate the the really long range and terrible difficulties with the building, the location, the use of the of uh, in of these buildings, of the jail, and so on. Uh, I am concerned with uh, that. A number of the comments by uh, community board leaders stated that they had not seen uh, some of the recent changes. I can't evaluate this, the importance of that, but I do. I did hear this, and with respect, um, Ms. Wong, that uh, I think um, uh, Carrie asked uh, when was the. Uh, when was this uh, some of the changes received at the community board and that they got them on, on April 7th? Not sure of the substance of it all, but I just wondered, if, uh, I appreciate that we don't want to delay forever. What is, however, a very lengthy and very important uh, cha changes here, not only for the demolition, but for the future of this space and for addressing other public space needs in the area. And I just wonder if um, there 
couldn't be some flexibility to provide a little more time for the community board uh, to be able to study any of the changes that were made and make at least a little more of a postponement. Uh, admittedly, that's hard here, but it seems to me that there's a great deal that the community board legitimately uh, should uh, be able to ask the questions and have all of the uh, information that they can without undue delay, but maybe some delay that could bring this process uh, to a better result, if not a terrific result. I'm sorry, I don't know the silence uh, but, or what to have next. That was a question and a bit of a suggestion. Um, DDC, can you respond to that, Dora, maybe? Yeah, um, we have gone to the community board multiple times. Um, we've gone to the land use committee twice since December. We've gone to the um, quality of life committee to present on the dismantle procedures and uh, to respond to community concerns. Um, we've been to the executive committee. So um, we have been to the community board multiple times. And um, the proposal that we showed is included um, a response to requests that we heard at the community board, for instance, to incorporate artwork. Um, but that was really the major change um, since we presented it last to the land use committee in terms of the design of the Sally Port. Really the thing that changed was adding the, the um, temporary artwork reproductions, which as I said, was something that we heard at the community board. So the complete proposal as you have it now and as presented has been presented to the community board in advance of this session today? It has not been presented to them with the artwork um, incorporated onto it. That was shared with the um, community board uh, um, chair, sorry, district manager last week. Thank you. Sure. And the artists have reviewed and, and, and are, and are have approved the, the artwork installation as shown? That's correct, yes. We, we worked with both artists to make sure that um, what we were showing today was acceptable to them. And we will continue to work with them to refine the details um, on how these, these temporary reproductions are installed. Uh, any further questions or comments from commissioners? Um, okay, so uh, before us then, um, we will, if I'm not mistaken here, we're going to vote on these three uh, proposals together. Um, so number one uh, is the um, uh, removal uh, of the, uh, the proposal for how the uh, uh, artworks that cannot be preserved in situ uh, will be uh, documented and uh, recreated uh, and will come back to us uh, uh, several times moving forward in the future. And the second one is for the design of the Sally Port itself. Um, before we uh, uh, take a vote, I just wanna hear uh, whether commissioners are comfortable uh, grouping these three uh, items together for a single vote. Does anyone have any objection to that? I object. Um, what, what would you like uh, as a proposal instead? Um, I would prefer to have uh, the archiving and storage and um, removal of the art separate than the other two items. The other one item? The other. Which is the salad bowl. Yes. Okay. Are other commissioners uh, in agreement with that? Agreement. Um, all right. Uh, if that's procedurally all right with you, Carrie, I will 
um, propose that we take two separate votes? Yes, absolutely. I, I didn't I didn't never intended them to be voted on together. Sorry if that was sorry about that confusion. Okay. Um, all right. So um, uh, vote number one is for the uh, arc documentation, archiving, uh, and a continued dialogue with the artists with regard to either a temporary and or a permanent installation, uh, reinstallation uh, of those pieces. So uh, uh, please vote in favor, against, abstain, table um, for the uh, items 28093 and 28094 regard to the artwork. Uh, Phil Ahrens. Still with us? You muted, Phil? There we go. Hi, I approve. Ken Seth Armstead. I approve, and I'd like to say that uh, much in proved from when we first saw it, there's been a lot of flexibility to maintain the relationship with the artists and maintain the artworks and recreate them. I approve. Thank you. Uh, Lori? Proof. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep track here in the right order. Uh, Karen Keel? Approve. Deborah Martin? Approve. Susan Morgenthau? Approve. Ethel Sheffer? Approve. Meryl Tisch? Approve. Mary Valverde? Approve. And myself, approve. All right, the second vote uh, is on the uh, Sally Port as presented, uh, inclusive of the uh, temporary recreations of the uh, artworks. Uh, and if you have any uh, comments you would like to add associated with your uh, vote, uh, please do so. Phil Ahrens. I would vote to table um, based on the lack of information adequately to the community board. And secondarily, I think we're rushing on something. There's no need whatsoever to rush on. Uh, Ken Seth Armstead. I would vote. I would vote to approve. Lori Hawkinson. I vote to table for more information. Karen Keel. I vote to table. Deborah Martin. I vote to table as well. Susan Morgenthau. I vote to table. Ethel Sheffer. I vote to table. Meryl Tisch. I would vote to approve, but I am, I am a little um, concerned that all of my colleagues who have given me great advice to date on this commission move to table. So I guess I would vote to table on behalf of my very thoughtful colleagues as we wait more information. Thank you. Uh, Mary? Table, please. And myself as well. So just to recap, uh, items 28093 and 28094 are approved uh, unanimously, I'll just say. Um, and item 28095, the Sally Port, uh, has a majority in favor of tabling the proposal. Commissioners, can you clarify what specific information you would like to receive? I believe that there was um, uh, a number of commissioners who uh, were concerned that the community board did not have uh, adequate time to review uh, the uh, revised proposal for the Sally Port that included uh, the incorporation of the artwork. Were there okay, any so other we'll, concerns? Okay, so we can add that, okay. Were there any other concerns that oh, you would like the staff to follow up on? I, I would just like to suggest, uh, if possible, that the, the uh, staff and the uh, uh, officers or whomever of the community board work out the, the time to meet and to do it 
faster at a time certain, not six months, nothing like that, but it should really, it should move along and a mutually acceptable time with all being heard should be done in an expeditious fashion. I would also like to add and ask one thing uh, to support what Ethel is suggesting. If the conditions remain the same, that there's a construction issue between demolishing beneath that site and that site, uh, then uh, really specifically earmark and show what it is that that problem is because that's what's necessitating the Sally Port. Because otherwise then, you know, it's not just about the aesthetics, it's about that functionally we need to remove an area and functionally we need to have it in a particular way, which is why I would vote to approve it now because if the conditions will not change, then you need this uh, new Sally, interim Sally Port. Uh, and and uh, I, th I think that clarification will allow people to see whether or not they, I like aesthetically the interim Sally Port, the core issue of why you need the interim Sally Port. I agree with Kenseth on that, totally. I think we have to understand that issue a little bit better. Yes. And, if, and if that condition doesn't change, we have to have an interim Sally Port. Yeah. Do, regardless of whether or not this is historic, regardless of not, you can't have an unsafe site upon which people need to enter and exit busloads at a time. We, so that is we yeah. We agree. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. I, and I would just. I, would I support just say, all my. Uh, I support all of my other commissioners on wanting to hold to get that clarification. Yes. I also uh, have uh, written down that we'll need a detail on the window. For uh, per uh, Commissioner Hawkinson's request. Yes. Um. Okay, thank you. I think we're ready to move on um, to the next item, uh, which is the last item on the public hearing. And it is for item 28096, Temporary Installation of Fearless Girl by Kristen Bisbal, Broad Street between Wall Street and Exchange Place, Manhattan. Um, we will uh, hear the applicants give their presentation then we will have public testimony uh, and then we can deliberate. Uh, please proceed applicants. I'm giving control to <coughs> Sarah Locklear. Carrie, um, do you wanna make an announcement again before we begin? Yes, sorry about that. Uh, yes, if you are in the Zoom meeting and would like to give testimony on this project, please be sure to rename your video so that it matches the name that you signed up with. And if you um, have not yet signed up, the, for, the uh, instructions for signing up are on the agenda. And also if you're watching on YouTube, the instructions are in the description below the video. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, can you hear me today? Should I get started? Yes, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, PDC commissioners, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I'm Sarah Locklear with State Street Global Advisors. I'm joined by Bill Higgins, whose professional expertise focuses on the preservation and evaluation of historical, architectural, and cultural landmarks in New York City. We have collaborated with Bill's firm, Higgins Quace Barth, on our presentation today. So thank you again for the opportunity to address the commission. I'm here to discuss the Fearless Girl statue currently on Broad Street. Because State Street is the owner of the original statue currently installed across from the stock exchange, we are here today seeking a new temporary three-year permit for Fearless Girl. In December, 2021, the Landmarks Preservation Commission offered unanimous support to keep Fearless Girl at her current location. During the presentation, I will share more on approvals and process to date. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this is a unique situation. We recognize that your standard process is to review public works of art prior to their creation or design process to be able to weigh in and offer feedback. Fearless Girl is a unique situation because it is already a completed work of art and it is already in place with a temporary permit. We look forward to discussing this unique situation in more detail today. 
In our presentation, I will go through the process to date of the statue installation and approvals that we have obtained. I'll then highlight the impact and importance of Fearless Girl, followed by its context and placement where Bill will jump in. Then I will close with our application ask before you all today. To start, State Street Global Advisors is the investment management arm of State Street Corporation. We work with institutions around the globe to help millions of people save for retirement, endowments and foundations to fund things like environmental and scientific breakthroughs and advisors to help their clients invest their life savings. In 2017, we saw that studies for years had shown that companies with women in leadership positions tend to perform better. However, at that time, one in four public companies still had all male boards. As a major shareholder of large companies across the globe, we have the ability to use our proxy voting power to impact real change. This is where Fearless Girl enters the picture. Over the night on the eve of International Women's Day 2017, we placed Fearless Girl in New York's financial district to ignite a conversation about the importance of gender diversity in corporate leadership. Fearless Girl is accompanied by a call on the companies in which we invest to increase the number of women on their corporate boards. Fearless Girl inspires women who are taking charge today and serves as inspiration for the next generation of female leaders. She also serves as a symbolic reminder of the extensive research showing that gender diversity in corporate leadership positions can yield better performance. We've seen real impact in our work to improve gender diversity on corporate boards. A report from PwC found that State Street's efforts on this important topic and the placement of the statue itself made this issue go mainstream, opening up the conversation in ways that had not happened previously. Kristen Visbal sculpted the statue and we are appreciative to have such an inspiring piece of artwork. As you may be aware, we have an ongoing legal matter involving the artist, but we're here today to focus on the original statue and the temporary permit application at hand. I will next go through the process to date of statue installation and approvals that State Street has obtained. Real Scroll is installed opposite the Charging Bull statue on March 7th, 2017, with a temporary seven day permit obtained through the DOT. Due to the resonance of the statue and its message, we worked with the DOT to obtain a longer permit through their arts program, extended until February 7th, 2018. We then worked with the mayor's office and the DOT to extend her stay and received another extension. In April, 2018, the mayor's office announced that she was opposite the stock exchange. In November, the statue was moved from her original location for maintenance and a repatina process. In December of that year, Fearless Girl was reinstalled at her current location. We obtained a temporary one-year permit from the Landmarks Preservation Commission working with the DOT. When the first temporary permit expired, we were able to obtain two additional one-year permits from the LPC, which required staff level approvals. With a third and final LPC temporary permit set to expire November 29th, 2021, we initiated a new permit process. First, we went to Community Board 1 and then the LPC. As mentioned, the LPC commissioners offered unanimous support to keep Fearless Girl in her current location, issuing an advisory report. Here is an image of her original placement for reference, as well as a map indicating where she was placed. Her original placement brought huge crowds to the area and instantly became a big tourist attraction. Working with the DOT, we chose to move her in December 2018 to opposite the stock exchange and its iconic facade. We partnered closely with the mayor's office, the LPC, and the DOT to choose the location and navigate the steps through the permitting process. At our current location at the stock exchange, Fearless Girl can have an even bigger impact providing a constant reminder to businesses and investors that women in corporate leadership positions are good for business. The statue's relocation in front of the stock exchange was informed by careful considerations of the site's context and maintenance needs. Broad Street was a much more pedestrian friendly alternative to her original location as there's no vehicle traffic and it's a wide street. We ensure that the placement was appropriately distanced from the curb for accessibility as well as from the stock exchange fence to ensure emergency vehicles could pass through. We are committed to the statue's maintenance and if our application is accepted, we plan to begin discussions to look into a repatina process. 
When she was reinstalled, we worked carefully with the LPC preservationists to ensure there was no impact to the granite curb or historic fabric. As mentioned, we see her placement across from the stock exchange as an important and inspirational message. The stock exchange trades many of the biggest and most recognizable public companies in the world and is in the heart of New York City's financial district. Her place there is about inspiring companies all over the world to recognize the power of women in leadership. And it's location along the pedestrian corridor frequented by both New York City residents and tourists maximizes the statue's message to inspire young women to reach for these positions of leadership. There is signage near the statue on Broad Street as created and required by the DOT. Here's a map indicating Fearless Girl's current placement as well as the DOT sign. Next, let's talk about the sculpture's impact. I mentioned before that Fearless Girl was originally intended to bring attention to the importance of gender diversity in leadership. But as we all know, Fearless Girl means so much more to so many people. While corporate board diversity is a key area where State Street Global Advisors as an asset manager can take direct action, it is certainly not how most people view the statue. Fearless Girls become a global phenomenon, something far beyond our original intention and more powerful than we imagined. The public even started a change.org petition in 2017 to keep Fearless Girl in place, which was signed by almost 40,000 people. We believe that Fearless Girl has become an inspirational and important New York City symbol far beyond our original intent. She has become one of the most popular tourist attractions in the area and an essential part of the city streetscape. Her resonance with the public has only continued to grow since 2017. People from all over the world come to visit the statue and share in her message. City groups like Downtown Alliance, whose mission it is to promote Lower Manhattan as a wonderful place to live, work, and play, have used Fearless Girl in their tourism promotions and content. We want residents and tourists to be able to continue to visit the statue, take pictures with her and be inspired. There are so few statues in New York City that depict women. Currently only five out of New York City's 150 statues of historic figures depict women as recognized with the mission and work behind She Built New York City as I'm sure you're familiar with. Even though Fearless Girl is of course not a historic figure, she helps to bring more female representation into the public art space, inspiring the next generation. As we see more and more research highlighting the unequal impact of the pandemic on working women, Fearless Girl has become an even more important symbol of resilience for many women and girls. As the last two years during the pandemic have made travel especially challenging and limited the sculpture's full impact due to decreased numbers of pedestrians, we believe it is important for Fearless Girl to remain in place so when visitors feel more comfortable traveling to the city again and more office workers return to the neighborhood, they can see she is still standing tall. We are so honored that she has become an inspiration to so many. I'll hand it over to Bill Higgins to discuss Fearless Girl and her impact to the neighborhood in more detail. Carrie, are you unable, are you able to um, unmute Bill? Yeah, we, we requested to unmute, so if you- There he is. Yep. Bill, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm William Higgins of Higgins Quaysbarth and Partners. It's our belief that the contribution of Fearless Girl as a work of public art in the financial district might best be assessed by considering it at three levels. As an artwork in itself, in the context of its immediate site, and as part of the larger group of public artworks which surround it and form a composite work of art, in the financial district of which Fearless Girl is a part. In itself, Fearless Girl is a bronze figure of a young girl with considerable presence. She embodies what her title states, daring, confident, fearless. In her iconic posture and strong demeanor, hands on hips, head held high, she continues to stand as an image of confidence despite the wind blowing against her. Fearless Girl is an artwork whose message and impact 
are at a scale well beyond its literal dimensions. Next to the context of Fearless Girl's immediate site or sites, the two places where Fearless Girl has stood leave no doubt that the wind against her is symbolic of the challenges women face in the worlds of business and finance. First on Broadway facing Charging Bull and now on Broad Street facing the dignified but rather intimidating New York Stock Exchange. In this sense, the work does something intriguing with the tradition of site-specific commemorative sculpture. Fearless Girl makes the whole financial district an element of the work itself as the scene of the issues and events it addresses. Site, both immediate and extended, has always been essential to the meaning of Fearless Girl. This brings us to the third, the third level of assessment, the larger network of public art and architecture on nearby sites in the financial district. Within a few blocks of Fearless Girl and sometimes directly visible in conjunction with her is a dense concentration of works which addresses the district's rich, complicated and often contradictory history and culture. The statue of George Washington across the street the bomb damaged JP Morgan and Company building immediately adjacent, the bronze names and dates commemorating the ticker tape parades on Broadway, the charging bull itself, the bowling green fence shorn of its symbols of monarchy in 1776, the US Customs House converted from a symbol of trade and financial might to the Museum of the American Indian. In all of these cases, Works of public art and architecture present multi-layered images of the history and culture of the financial district. In all of them, including Fearless Girl, valid positive images are interwoven with the possibility of alternative themes and interpretations. We believe that this multiplicity of meaning is part of what makes Fearless Girl and every good work of public art a continuing source of relevance and discussion over time. We hope this brief analysis helps to make it clear that Fearless Girl is part of a rich and interrelated collection of works of architecture and public art that presents both commemoration and critical commentary on the remarkable place of the financial district in the history of the city, the nation, and the world. We respectfully ask that the Public Design Commission approve the application before you for Fearless Girl both as a vibrant part of this multi-layered collection and for its individual merits as a work of public art with a significant message worthy of ongoing and nuanced discussion. Thanks, and I'll hand it back to Sarah. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, to wrap up, we're, we're here today to request approval for a new temporary three-year permit to keep Feral Squirrel in her current location on Broad Street. If our application is accepted, we plan to engage relevant New York City agencies shortly thereafter to discuss the future of the statue at the end of this permit. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you, applicants. Um, I believe we do have some uh, testimony. And yes, we do. Uh, is Kristen Visbal? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Kristen. Thank you so much. Uh, this is going to be about six or seven minutes. I'm counting on Carrie's promise just to give me a little bit of extra time. I was not able to formally present today. So as you know, I'm Kristen Visbal, the artist who created Fearless Girl. I own copyright in the artwork and have serious concerns about the way the State Street proposal has been advanced through the system and presented. In my written statement, I responded to the appendix and the State Street proposal, and I hope you've all had a, a chance to read it. Uh, I believe the SSGA inaccuracies give the wrong impression about the corporation's role and about the legal issues surrounding my copyright, which has been vindicated. Of primary concern today is my required role in decision-making around my artwork and the Design Commission ensuring the work's continued presence in a manner that is reasonable and protects artists' rights. I was furnished with the DOT maintenance agreement over Fearless Girl just this past November. 
We unveiled Fearless Girl five years ago, and I just saw the document. The agreement defines my responsibilities and rights, all without my knowledge. How could the city sign an agreement over my intellectual property without including me in the negotiations? State Street and the DOT have not treated me fairly, nor have they abided by their very own contract in ensuring artist participation around Fearless Girl. The commission should be aware, as Heather, I think Heather said, that State Street has sued me, which makes it impossible for them to act as fair agent on my behalf, as stated in the DOT maintenance agreement, and essentially renders that maintenance agreement null and void. The DOT agreement states I'm the key decision maker. It states that SSG, SSGA is merely acting as my agent, yet the DOT has not respected me, they have not consulted me, and will not even afford me the courtesy of returning my messages. In 2017, the DOT barred my access to my own work to perform a preservation scan when the original mold was withheld from me. With no way to reclaim my work, I was forced to sign an agreement with a financial who presented to me their interest in upholding the legal ideals behind the work, which were sub subsequently ignored. From my perspective, from the beginning, the DOT has been complicit with SSGA, entirely unreasonable, given that the DOT maintenance agreement and the intervention program are centered on the artist, complete with contractual provisions designed to protect the artist. Let's face it, all of these rights exist only because I created the artwork of my own volition, and I did not create her for SSGA. I am convinced the only way artists' rights can be honored and acknowledged is if the city owns the work. This would ensure equitable and fair evaluation in addressing any issue which might arise. I know the Public Design Commission typically works with the artists in the review process, and I'm here now and prepared to answer any questions you may have about how this work came to be. Fearless Girl is a powerful symbol, one we should protect and ensure and nurse to the benefit of all. We all want her to remain, but how she remains is significant. I would like to participate in her continued success and I'm disappointed I have not been consulted. I hope you will make the issue of artist participation in a work which was never purchased and only assumed a question fundamental to your decision today. As far as I understand the DOT agreement, ownership of the physical casting bears no relevance on the creator's right to make decisions about her work, including how the figure is displayed, signage, advertising, the condition of the work, and whether she is used as a brand. State Street and the city have come under repeated criticism that Fearless Girl is an advertising gimmick. I created her solely for the public. I did not create the figure as a brand, and I have every legal right to defend the integrity of my work. According to the agreement signed by the financial and me, the parties pledged to uphold the legal ideals behind the figure, and instead, these ideals have been supplanted by a brand message and obstructed through the failure to share the artwork. I understand the normal expectation in New York City is that the city owns public art. In fact, I've never heard of a corporation owning a public work on public land. City ownership would present a fair resolution to this matter. If the commission approves yet another temporary permit, you set a brand new precedent for long-term temporary permits in New York, driving up review time and changing current accepted practice. I've been told the city doesn't accept donated works, but is it typical that a work would stand on a temporary basis for eight years? And do you really want to do all this again in three years? Considering this potential circumstance, perhaps it would not be so unusual for the city to accept a donation. 
Surely gifts have been accepted before. Eventually, the city will need to own the work, but the State Street proposal assumes the work can stand ad infinitum on a temporary basis, allowing them to use her as they please instead of for the people. My offer to note, donate an artist proof casting holds no such strings attached. State Street has engaged a lobby firm to impact this review. It is reasonable to assume that the same restriction around lobbying that you see in the DOT maintenance agreement would be enforced in a renewal of that same maintenance agreement, which renders State Street ineligible for a permit renewal of your own city document. <laughs> From a moral perspective, I asked the commission to think about the message that relegating this work to a temporary status would send. Are we saying that a discussion of diversity and equality is only a fad that will run its course? The World Economic Forum projects 135.6 years to achieve gender parity. This work will be relevant for a long, long time. I Kristen, if you can wrap up. Please. This is it. Okay. I propose the commission reject this temporary extension in lieu of permanence, or that you condition a reduced temporary extension with a mandate that the city explore temp uh, ownership promptly. <laughs> a three-year temporary permit does not protect artist rights. It does not acknowledge my offer to donate an artist proof casting for ownership, and it does not fulfill the fundamental mission of the design commission to do justice to the public space. Thank you for the extra time. And I have some comments, but uh, does anybody have questions from me? Okay, we're gonna move on to the all, uh, let everyone speak. Um, next person is Todd Fine. Hello, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, which advocates for public art in New York City. And, and I, I love the New York City's public art collection and its public art regime, and I respect the work of the Public Design Commission. Sometimes I worry that we give you a little bit too much respect, maybe perhaps for your own comfort. And this occasional tension we have among advocates in the public sphere about the use of public space and about private interests is why I, I just can't understand why the commission would entertain such an extraordinary arrangement that appears to be a, a new category of public art. Corporately owned public art on public land, used as advertising, in perpetuity, without any guidance to future plans, without any design commission input in its display and presentation. Page 22 of the presentation spoken by William Higgins makes it clear that this is considered a quasi-permanent work of the city's collection, that's the word they used, not as a temporary work planned for removal after three years. It seems like this decision will have so many extraordinary effects, both on the precedent and the here and now moral issues with the treatment of the artists under the maintenance agreement. The extraordinary nature of this proposal far surpasses any aversion to using somewhat irregular city processes to accept a gifted work, something that we do see every few years, despite protests to the contrary. In New York City, we know that everything is impossible until it becomes politically necessary. The basic principles here are against indefinite private ownership of public art and against the essential surrendering of the mission of the Public Design Commission are very clear. And I and other public advocates can argue them in perpetuity as well. We can argue them today, in three years, in six years, in nine years. Every 30 of your meetings of your commission until the sun explodes, we can debate them with lobbyists, with corporate executives, and with the artists. Taking up your time, and creating continual cynicism about the role of private power in New York City's public art regime. And judging by the heavy use of lobbyists, Kassir LLC, and the months that State Street has been maneuvering on this, this would all start up again in two years, becoming a private constant and in corporate intervention into the city's public art programs. I hope you will give yourself and future staff, members, and chairs of this commission a break. Please don't repeat the farcical and impossible situation we have with a certain bovine sculpture down the street. If city agencies want to display this in perpetuity, they should work with all parties, with the Design Commission, on a long-term proposal and regularize the work once and for all. Council Member Christopher Marte has offered to facilitate this in a letter I hope you've all received. It does deserve to stay, and I respect the uh, impact of the work, which I believe is due to the talent of the sculpture, and we should never underestimate that. 
Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the list is Victoria Hillstrom. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Victoria Fariello. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Victoria Fariello. I'm a district leader in uh, Assembly District 65 Part C, which encompasses the area where the Fearless Girl stands now. And I think most everyone would agree that the Fearless Girl has come to symbolize women's empowerment in all walks of life. And it is a powerful reminder to young girls that they stand up for themselves. And I've watched hundreds of young children marvel at the statue, and I have myself. I ask that the commission work with the artist and the copyright holder, Kristen Bisbal, to ensure integrity and meaning of the statue. While I understand the current proposal is for a three-year extension, I urge the commission to work with all parties to find a solution to make the statue permanent and um, to keep it downtown. Um, and also, in particular, I ask that you consider accepting the artist proof of a casting um, for, of the statute. So thank you so much for your time. And I do hope that we can continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Manny Alejandro. Manny, we, are you there? Yes. Okay, good, good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Manny Alejandro. I, I both live and work in a financial district and we need to keep sight and remain focused clearly on bringing New York City back post-COVID, we need to make sure that New York City remains to be the financial capital of the world. There were recently some conferences in Miami um, and last week, and they had a uh, charging bolt and a, a new version of charging bolt uh, representing Miami as the new financial capital of the world. We can't forget that. We can't lose sight of this. It's fundamentally important to all of us here to our families, to future generations, that New York City remains to be that financial capital world and to signify really what that means. There are clearly iconic landmarks in the financial district. I mentioned Charging Bull. You have Federal Hall and clearly Fearless Girl. But what she represents in terms of what she represents as an iconic sculpture but also where she is physically located. Nonetheless, it's not only important for Fearless Girl to remain where she is now, but we need to look at a permanent solution. I don't really think it makes sense to keep doing this and, and really get everybody back again, talking about this in a couple of years. We're coming out of COVID, hopefully I pray, we don't re-enter any kind of COVID lockdowns or restrictions. We're trying to get people back to work. And it's fundamentally important that at this time we have a new mayor who just passed 100 days in office. There's no reason why we can't all come together, led by the mayor's office, Mayor Eric Adams' office, and the Public Design Commission working with the city and State Street and, and, and Ms. Visball in terms of coming up with a long-term solution. It just means too much to the city. We, if, if we lose Fearless Girl, and we lose Fearless Girl where she presently is, I'm not quite sure what New York City will become. Maybe the New York Stock Exchange itself eventually will move to Miami. Maybe it'll move to Texas. Who knows? So we need to keep things where they are with an eye towards permanence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I just, just a reminder, if you are signed up to testify, please make sure that the name of your video matches the name that you use to sign up with. Uh, so the next person on the list is Victoria Hillstrom. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you very much for having me. I have been part of arts and culture in New York City up for 25 years. I am a designer. Our work has been published around the world. Uh, and um, I would just like to say that arts and culture is part of our DNA and is critical to our recovery uh, from the pandemic. And it New York City's respect for artists and artist rights seems to be glossed over here. We all heard from State Street somehow owning Kristen's work, which uh, obviously 
uh, her passion has hit the money notes with people from around the world, where from my vantage point, we are saying that New York City supports women. New York City supports women to break this glass ceiling in the financial world and, and of course, all other parts of our economy, that uh, TV and film will bring in more revenue than our state taxes by 2025. We have always supported arts and culture, the loft laws. Artists came to New York because they could live and work here affordably. We have very, very relevant artists that have always lived in New York. Uh, Mark, uh, Tom Ford uh, just gave a message for hope to bring the city back where fashion, film, music, entertainment, and the arts brought the city back during Fashion Week. What I would like to say is that I take extreme issue with the notion that the artist has been buried in lawsuits, that State Street has somehow trampled her rights, think that she has no say in the matter, that I would merely ask this commission to demand that the contract is revisited, that Kristen's rights are respected. Otherwise, Kuhn's, Zapata, uh, all of the great artists will not display their work here. We won't be known as, as for arts and culture. And it's something that we need to think very long and hard how to protect. And so uh, I, I would just say uh, Basquiat was like family to us. We have signed Warhols, signed directly to us. We certainly knew Peter Beard and uh, Schnabel we know very well. Uh, we really need to look at how we are treating the arts and arts and culture. And if, in fact, this fearless girl is a symbol of what we believe in and our message to the world, something is very, very gone wrong here, where we have an artist saying, my rights have been violated and they won't even return my call. And so I would ask this commission, regardless of any contract that exist to ask State Street to revisit their contract and make this right before we grant them the ability to do anything. This is not their work. This is her work. And it is New York City symbol of what women can do in our city. And I uh, would just like to thank you all very much for your time. And uh, I am really very heartbroken and bewildered with what is going on in Soho, with what is going on in North Brooklyn. We thank you. are amazing. Thank you. Um, the next person is Mary Luke. Rebecca, do we have Mary Luke here? Sorry, I did not that I see I'm searching now. If you're on with a different name, if you could raise your hand or rename yourself. Uh, we can come back and see if Mary comes back on. The next person is Tazneem Ismailiji. Hi, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I am Tasneem Ismailji. I speak in support of Fearless Girl becoming a permanent installation. Fearless Girl has become a global symbol of women's equality, equal pay, and equity. She stands for education for girls and women, and for women being leaders, and for diversity. I was born in Pakistan and came to this country as a physician 51 years ago as a fearless girl. Pakistan has given birth to another fearless girl, Malala. I want to bring my grandchildren to be inspired by fearless girl in New York City. People come from all over the world to visit New York City and fearless girl is an inspiration for those who behold her. I am so, so grateful to the artist, Kristen Wisbell, for creating her. Please, please, Commission, 
support Kristen and her rights. I appeal to you to make Fearless Girl a permanent installation. Fearless Girl is a commanding symbol of women's rights in perpetuity. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person is Selkin Cohen. I don't see a Selkin. Again, there are a couple of phone numbers and Zoom users. If you're on, uh, please raise your hand or rename yourself. Yes, very important. If you your name does not match the name that you signed up with, we might not be able to find you, uh, but we will do our best. So Laura Tenenbaum. Oh, sorry, one sec. Zoom user, are you Selkin Cohen? Okay, if you're not Selkin, yeah, Zoom user, I see you raising your hand. Hold on. Cynthia D. Bartola. Okay, we'll um, we'll get to you later in the list if you haven't signed up already. If you can, in I the did. meantime, change your name, please. Okay, how about Laura Tenenbaum? I think I'm unmuted now. I think I've hit it about 15 yes. times. Go okay. ahead. Hi, my honored commissioners. My name is Laura Tenenbaum. I've lived with my artist husband in an all artist co-op in Soho for close to 50 years. I speak not only to support extending the temporary placement of Fearless Girl, but also to support taking it further and making the placement permanent. This is why I think it's important. Back in 2017, I attended a presentation on civics in a space that overlooked the square where it was placed opposite Charging Bull Sculpture owned by Demotica. I was taken by how the crowd was reacting so positively to Fearless Girl. Women and girls particularly wanted to be photographed with it. It was a huge crowd. I was so taken in fact that when my teenage children, grand grandchildren visited from Montana, I took them to see the fearless girl. They loved her. So many do. Just look at the multitude of photos posted in Instagram and other social media. That is because fearless girl was and is an inspiring symbol about women in empower women's empowerment and place in the world. We don't have enough sculptures like that in New York. I cannot help but state how much I appreciate Kristen Visible's willingness to work with you and other agencies to ensure that our city can own its own casting of this iconic sculpture, as well as allow nonprofits and international organizations to use images of Fearless Girl to further the cause of women's equality in the world. This is in stark contrast with the policy of my former neighbor, Arturo de Modica, who would only turn over ownership of his sculpture for millions of dollars. He basically held Charging Bull hostage once it became so established, it was impossible to ever consider removing it. You had to renew permission over and over again. I urge you to work with Ms. Visible, who makes no such demands and make placement of Fearless Girl permanent. In closing, I again urge you not to only extend the placement, but to make it permanent. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Cheryl Benton. Thank you. I'm Cheryl Benton, and thank you for allowing me to speak today on behalf of the fearless girl and her sculptor, Kristen Visible. I have been a longtime advocate for equality for women and girls with organizations like UN Women and Plan International. And I was so excited when I first saw the fearless girl when she appeared in New York City on International Women's Day. And at that time, it was certainly a brilliant public relations coup, and it was drawing awareness to the importance of that day and equality for women and girls. And now, of course, the fearless girl has become a symbol of empowerment for girls around the world. And as others have said, all you have to do is scroll through social media and you will literally see thousands and thousands of girls 
standing proudly next to her with their hands on their hips. Um, I really, really hope that this complicated issue gets resolved equitably, that the rights of the artist are preserved, and that Fearless Girl becomes a permanent part of the greatest city in the world and continues to be a beacon for the bravery and empowerment of girls, especially in the chaotic and war-torn world that we now live in. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. And um, Kurtiga Reddy. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Kirtika Reddy, and uh, behind me is a picture of an I, um, along with an all-immigrant, all-female team, rang the New York Stock Exchange bell for the IPO of Athena Technology to SPAC. I'm an investor and an operator. I'm an immigrant. My mother, who did not have the opportunity to finish her high school education because she was a girl, watched with pride as I rang the bell and I took this picture with Fearless Girl. And my two daughters, who are also in this picture, were with me. Fearless Girls stands for empowerment, for gender equity all across the globe. And um, as I stand here, I literally, you know, I think I'm trying to control my tears for just the possibility of Fearless Girl not having a permanent permit. Um, it is just atrocious that that is even on the table for being considered. And I really hope that um, the respected commission considers Kristen Bispel's rights uh, in this matter um, and works with all parties to make Fearless Girl a permanent installation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I see someone has their hand raised. We are gonna go through the list. We're going in the order in which people have signed up. At the end of that, we'll circle back and see if we missed anyone. Uh, the next person is Ian Houston. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much. I think that this is a fantastic conversation. I was just in New York as part of a parade for Scottish Americans. I think what, what we have here is a, a parade of voices, and there's always room for common ground. And from my standpoint, I'd like to offer my words in support of Kristen. I was in New York in January. You'll remember this uh, the horrible storm, snowstorm that we had in late January. And I was around the Wall Street area. I came down to uh, Wall Street and there it was everything covered in snow. And as I walked by uh, Wall Street and uh, Dow Jones, there was Fearless Girl. She was uh, had uh, her feet covered in snow. And it was poignant to me that through that storm, there she was, still strong, feet covered in snow, uh, but still symbolic uh, of what she represented. I'd like to pose a question for the commission. And the question I would pose is, is the fight for women's equality temporary? is the fight for girls' education, where 62 million girls are not in school around the world, temporary? Is the fight for equal pay, temporary? Is advocacy for women's economic empowerment, temporary? Of course, the answer is an emphatic no. It is not temporary. These campaigns, these marches, these fights for permanent and ongoing justice are not just in New York, but they're around the world. And New York City is the world, is a representation of the world. This remarkable statue, from my standpoint, that inspires people from all walks of life and all stations in life must be permanent in New York. The city and the public must own the statue and doing so shows a permanent commitment to the values for, for which the statue captures. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Todd Brown. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, so I represent the Inspire Project. I really appreciate you uh, allowing me a couple of minutes here. Um, I work with kids in schools all over the world. Um, and I got to know Kristen uh, quite a few years ago as all of this was coming about. Um, by trade, uh, I'm a recovering teacher. Um, I am a computational sociologist. So basically I quantify how social connectivity impacts behavior and social change. Um, I'm not sure, you know, Ian had some good points actually segueing into what I wanted to say. You know, we're talking about how much Fearless Girl means and what she stands for, but we want to look at it from a sociological principle called uh, symbolic annihilation. Symbolic annihilation is basically what's not reported or what's not represented and how it can kill a movement. So instead of talking about what she stands for, think about what kind of message is going to be sent or could be sent if she's taken away. And you'll say, ah, she's never, she's never going to be taken away. She will be permanent. We have to go through this process every few years. That shadow of potential, the idea of possibly being taken away, sends a message to all ages. Let me give you a quick story. I won't take much of your time. Uh, when I introduced my classes to Fearless Girl, I was actually teaching seventh grade. I had three female students in seventh grade that started a quiz, a female and male recognition, historical figure recognition quiz. It grew to 150,000 people from seventh, these three seventh grade girls. They did it online. Males recognize males 90% of the time. Males recognize females or sorry, males recognize males 90%. Females recognize males 89%. Males recognize females historically 20% of the time and females recognize their own sex 18% of the time. So think about this. They were, they were growing the study. They were, they were getting people from all ages from nine to 89. It's a longitudinal issue, equality. If you were to even think about taking it away or removing the statue, it causes an issue. When things started popping up in the media and these kids heard, hey, this may be just temporary, you know what their response was? Well, why are we putting all this effort into it? Because it's going to go away anyway and everybody's going to forget about it. We can't do that. This is kind of for us. This is like a Statue of Liberty for kids. Multi-generational. It's a multiple generation problem that will never go away if we don't have representation for both males and females. What does it mean to me as a male to see all of these females represented in such excitement? It puts them on the map in my face. So it's not just about female equality, it's the perception of equality from a male perspective as well. So permanence is really the only, really the only option here in my opinion. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, I just in the middle of the testimony commissioners and, and just for the general public too, because I know some people might jump off. I do want to take a, take a moment to just clarify the, the public design commission. Um, we cannot today vote on whether or not this uh, statue is permanent. We are limited in legally what we are allowed to do today, which is uh, vote on what was uh, submitted to us by the Department of Transportation, which is a temporary installation up to three years. So I just want to make that clear, um, you know, even if commissioners do support permanence, either at this site or somewhere else or from State Street or the artist, um, we, I mean, of course, we're welcome to listen to everyone, but we cannot today vote on permanence because um, <laughs> The Public Design Commission, we review proposals submitted to us by city agencies. So something, any proposal has to be approved by a city agency that then formally makes a submission to us. So I just want to make sure that's clear. And I will restate that at the end, but wanted to chime in now. Um, and to continue, the next person we have is, and also I do want to note that any uh, letters, any written testimony per standard procedure, which is included this is on our website and it's also in the sign up form. Anything that was received in advance was forwarded to the Public Design Commission members. So if you know if there's a letter that we that was sent, they received it. Thank you. The next person is Tina Arensen Willemson. Yes, hello everyone. Um, a lot has been said already, so thank you for just a couple of minutes. I am dialing in from Copenhagen in Denmark. It's 7 o'clock p.m. here. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, take you up in the helicopter maybe. Um, we work globally on advancing diversity, um, equality and equity, uh, especially with corporates. Um, however, as everyone else, and I, I did note what you just said, but we really feel very strongly that the statue of, um, of Mr. Vespal should be permanent. It should be owned by the city, it should be owned by the citizens, but in my view, of course, it be, should be owned by the citizens of the world. Uh, New York is the center of, of 66 million tourists every year. Imagine, as others have already said, all the tourists coming to your city and seeing this kind of statue. Everybody goes to the financial districts. It's, it's part of, of any kind of tour of the city. But most of all, when we're talking about gender equality, the World Economic Forum is, is every year measuring the, the equality gap. And as you may know, with the horrible pandemic, everything has actually gone backwards. So it used to be 99 years to close the gender gap. Now it's 135 years, as it was mentioned before. We're really going the wrong way. Um, it has also been estimated by McKenzie that we work with that about 34% now of the women in the workforce are either considering leaving, globally speaking, leaving the workforce or going part-time. So we must keep pushing globally this topic forward. And obviously the fearless girl has been a conversation piece. It has been photographed and I really think it has a lot of merit to stay like that. At the same time, also, we work a lot with role models, and it's said again and again with the young women that we meet in universities and colleges out there, that they look up, and in their organizations, they actually can't see role models. They open the newspapers, especially the financial newspapers, and they can't see themselves. So this is why, amongst other things, I've written a book called Womenomics, um, and the rise of the female growth potential. And in that book, actually, I didn't know Kirsten Rispel, but I actually found the the images and, and, and bore the permission to put it in the book. It's, it's read again by, by lots and lots of people. I think this um, art piece is fantastic and I do not at all understand um, the issues that are happening legally because it's, it's her piece of work, it's her vision. And it has obviously um, sounded really widely across the world. So um, please listen to the artist. And I really hope next time I come to New York that the fearless girl will still be there. Thank you. Thank you. The next person, Ileana Raya. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. There, go ahead. Yep, you got it, uh, Raya. Raya. Um, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Ilana Raya, and I'm the founder of ETRA, a girls mentorship platform, and the author of Girls Who Do You Wanna Be? and the Epic Mentor Guide. We bring girls directly into companies to meet female leaders face-to-face and for years, I've happily brought girls to see the Fearless Girl statue anytime we meet Wall Street women. Our girls start as young as middle school. And to say that coming face to face with the Fearless Girl is impactful would be an understatement. Among the startling stats about girls is that in research notes that between the ages of eight and 14, girls' confidence can drop by up to 30%. Financial confidence in particular is more important now than ever. And knowing that the Fearless Girl is in her place standing in their high tops, standing for them and representing them is crucial. To today's girl, she is more than a symbol of courage. She's an icon of financial independence, empowerment and gender equity. Girls should know that these ideals last longer than one International Women's Day, that they last longer than a limited three year period. Girls everywhere, whether they can visit her in the next three years or not, need to know that she stands in New York City permanently on their behalf, that she belongs to the public, to today's girls and tomorrow's leaders. Through my six years of bringing girls into New York City companies, I know well that the city stands firmly behind its girls, throwing open its doors and cheering them on. So it is my sincere hope that today's decision or a future decision reflects those ideals and ensures that New York City permanence for the fearless girl. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is Heiko Fisher. Heiko. There they are. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, you caught me right in the moment when I have to call the nanny and tell her that uh, I'm coming home late. So it's, I'm calling you from Berlin. It's 7 p.m. like in Copenhagen. Um, 
I'm the CEO and founder of Resource for Humans, a technology company here in Germany. And we're one of the owners of one of the replicas of Fearless Girl that you can see behind me. I'd like to raise my voice on behalf of uh, Kristen as the original artist of Fearless Girl. And I, I think there's kind of an elephant in the room, right? I mean, you have a corporation with endless resources and you have a, an artist with a vision and um, these things are going around. And I think we're kind of holding hostage an idea that has transcended um, any petty dispute at this point. And the story I want to share with you to illustrate that and to urge you to work with uh, the original artist and revoke temporary or go for permanent residency is that uh, we're currently hosting two young ladies from the Ukraine who have fled from the Russian invasion and they brought their three daughters to the age of three months, four years and eight years. And um, we brought them to Berlin to safety. They're living in our basement currently, uh, which is still better than Odessa, which has been completely bombed out. And um, we took them around Berlin and we showed them some of the landmarks, one of which is the candy bomber. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's one of the airplanes that was used in the airlift after the second world war when America saved Germany from uh, being cut off from Russia. So we were, we were in the west part of Berlin and they were cutting it off. And um, it stands there as a, as a permanent installation, as a reminder for moral values. And the place is so important and it means so much to the Berliners, to the Germans and to Europeans to see that there was a true north after the world war and that was America. And this plane sits in that place representing that. And I think Fearless Girl, holds a space too. And she represents something that transcends all these disputes and looking at it from the outside, from a European perspective, looking at the US, I think it would be fantastic. She had a permanent home where she would uh, showcase all the values that America stood for back then and still stands for. So um, having four daughters myself and three more surrogate daughters now in the basement, um, I'd urge you to support Kristen, work with the artist make her permanent and not go for something temporary. She deserves more than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person is Caroline or Caroline, sorry, Kotsi. Rebecca, is Caroline Kotsi? I don't believe that they're on the line. Okay, we'll come back. Tracy Forsyth. I don't see them either. Sandy Lizza. Yep, Sandy, be good. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sandra Liza. I am a former elected municipal official who worked closely with my city's public arts commission to bring enjoyment and engagement of art to our community. I appreciate your service to New York City and advocacy of your mission to innovative, sustainable, and equitable design to public spaces for all. Fearless Girl has become transformative for New York City and the country, not only as a work of art, but also by significantly engaging the community and raising consciousness and discussion of women in society. In future historical review of leadership, I have no doubt that Fearless Girl will be cited as helping to define this period which inspired and catapulted more young women into prominent roles in leadership in our country. Fearless Girl continues to be photographed and portrayed as an upward symbol around the world today. It's a destination for many visitors to New York City and importantly, it is engaging our youth. I heartily encourage the commission to lead the effort to ensure Fearless Girl is permanently part of New York City, respecting the artist copyright holder and the work itself. Public ownership will ensure permanence, which is clearly in the public interest. Please uh, employ your advocacy mission to reach out to the appropriate city personnel to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is Claudia Ruiz in? Yes, Claudia, if you could accept the request on you. Claudia. 
Claudia, it looked like you unmuted for a second, but then remuted yourself. You should, oh, there you go. Okay. Good morning from Mexico City. Today, uh, more than ever, women have shown time and time again the importance of their role in society from rural or indigenous women to great CEOs. The statue represents us and reminds us the place of the woman in the society. It is a cry of conscience for giving them the place they deserve and remind us the gender equity. So as an educator, it is teaching to the world in a showcase like New York City that we need to be more including. And we need to put in women and girls at the center of the economies will fundamentally because women are the backbone of the recovery in communities and of course by this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The next person is Enrique Villanueva. Go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you very much for, for letting me give my opinion. I am Enrique Villanueva from Mexico City. And as an educator, I want to share a couple of thoughts I think are very important. Uh, I do believe that Fabulous Girl is a symbol reminding, reminding us what we should never forget. The importance of women all over the world, the empowerment, the courage, the strong they represent, and of course, the love they mean. New York is a city everybody wants to visit. Let's keep Phil Bell sharing her message to the world. Let's have another New York icon to be visited and a message to be shared. Let's still giving voice to this sculptor. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person is Lauren Fritz. I don't see them on the line. Okay, how about Sally Wolf? Sally, if you can accept, yep. Hi, thank you for having me here today. My name is Sally Wolf, and I'm here today as the lifelong New Yorker, a former Wall Street intern, a former DNI expert, corporate executive, and a current entrepreneur. And I'm someone who believes that fearless girls should be a permanent fixture in our city. Fearless Girl inspires both young women and grown women alike. I see myself in her, myself as an intern who walked that very block every day and felt incredibly out of place, not seeing folks like myself. I see myself now as an entrepreneur professionally, fearless in this endeavor, and also someone who lives with metastatic breast cancer personally and strives to be fearless in that way in this city as well, striving to be fearless in all aspects of my life. And I also look at Fearless Girl and see my nieces who are currently four and six years old and all that they can become. And I also see their older brother, my eight-year-old nephew, seeing Fearless Girl in an equally important way because he sees his sisters in front of the New York Stock Exchange. 20 years after my Wall Street internship, I returned to Broad Street this January when I was honored to join two others here today, one of whom you already heard from, Kirthiga as they rang the opening bell. And one of the biggest joys that morning was standing alongside Fearless Girl with an all-female, all-immigrant IPO team, one of the founders having her two daughters there in person. And when we took so many pictures, each of us in our own unique personal journeys that brought us there, there was also a universality to our connection to that single statue, the Fearless Girl. This mission feels relevant in a permanent, not temporary way. And it also feels relevant in a way that supports the artist, Kristen, who created that, her own ability to create and contribute to our city. While I was an executive at Time Warner, I created an incubator that invested in artists and storytellers. And the single most important legal decision we made 
at that big company early on was to ensure that even as we invested in innovative artists, they preserve the ownership of their intellectual property. I feel the same way here. The sculpture is all about empowerment and to remove that empowerment from the artist herself is unaligned with the mission of the sculpture. And to require her to invest so much of her time in an ongoing way in this matter removes her ability to spend her time focusing on her tremendous artistic talents and creating even more incredible art for our city and our world. Thank you for your time. Ian Houston. I don't see them on the line. Okay. Leslie Wright. They're not here either, it appears. Okay. Tiana Prado. Nope. Laura Hartman. Nope. Lily Cheng. I've seen Lily on, it looks like she's no longer online. Okay, Katrina Dudley. Great, hi, I'm Katrina Dudley. I'm a senior vice president, investment strategist and portfolio manager at Franklin Templeton Investments. As the co-author of Undiversified, the big gender short in investment management, I'm a fearless advocate for increasing gender diversity in the finance industry. Our research has pro proven that you can't be what you can't see. Statues such as Fearless Girls, Girl are physical representations to every female in our city that they have a place in finance. To me, the Fearless Girl statue is a symbol of women's leadership in the finance industry. As a 20-year veteran of finance, I have been a mentor and advocate for women in finance for many years. The statue represents the unlimited opportunities that are open to women in the financial services industry. Less than 4% of NYC statues depict women, significantly lower than our representation in the general population. The most famous Wall Street statue is of a bull and seemingly represents the men of Wall Street. It is time that we had a permanent statue that represents the women of Wall Street. Fearless Girl fills that void. The current location of the statue in front of the historic New York Stock Exchange is symbolic. Muriel Seabrook was one of the first women to own a seat on the NYSE and was the first woman to head one of the NYSE member firms. She was also a fierce advocate for women in finance and has this distinction of being called one of the first women of finance. If she was still with us, I am confident that she would have been at today's hearing, advocating that the statue remain in its current location. I ask that you not only renew the permit for the Fearless Girl statue, but make it a permanent structure in New York City as a sign of the city's belief that empowering our next generation of women is something our great city wants to be known for. Thank you. Thank you. Is Cheryl Benton in the room? Not that I see. Okay, so I've gone through the list. And I see there are some hands raised. I'm going to um, call on some people who I guess hadn't signed up previously. So uh, Isabel Freedom. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I did sign up, uh, but late. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, I didn't see your name. And if you can uh, allow me to share my screen, that'd be great. I'm sorry, we're not allowing sh screen sharing. All right. Um, okay, well, thank you for having me here. I'm Isabel Friedheim. I am a venture capitalist and chairman of New York Stock Exchange, uh, publicly traded companies and CEO of one of them. I was the youngest female chairman of a publicly traded company ever. And the fearless girl has been an inspiration to me. It signifies defiance in the face of a millennia of gender inequality. Yet it signifies the trends that we've seen, particularly in the most recent decades, securing a woman's right to vote, for example. But fast forwarding to the most recent progress, the first 
female Supreme Court justice, the first female vice president, a dozen female founders of companies that have gone public through IPOs. And these are not trivial achievements. So Fearless Girl is, she's not white, she's not black, she's not Indian, she's not Latina, she is all of us women. I personally stood proudly next to Fearless Girl and posted and wrote about it as a symbol of all of my accomplishments. Uh, Phyllis Newhouse was the first African-American woman CEO of a New York Stock Exchange listed company to ring the bell for an IPO. Um, and if you had allowed me to share my screen, I would have shown you a picture. She was my partner and she and I celebrated this achievement together by Fearless Girl, um, along on video with her 90 year old mother and my four year old daughter. Fearless Girl was central in those celebratory moments. And those achievements are not temporary. They're the beginning of permanent progress. Uh, subsequent to that, the first Korean American CEO ever to ring the bell did the same. She too was my partner and we proudly celebrated with Fearless Girl. Kartika Reddy, my partner, also on this call, uh, who you heard earlier, celebrated her taking a company public along with her two young daughters and celebrated by Fearless Girl. When women achieve the pinnacle of success in the capital markets, we celebrate with the Fearless Girl and she is inspiration. And the fearless girl transcends time. Its physical representation, its stance, is the single most important symbol of women's triumphs in the city of New York. She belongs where she is. She belongs to the artistic vision of her creator, Kristen Visible. She belongs to the people, not to a corporation. And the city of New York is lucky to be in a position to make it permanent and a powerful motivator for all generations of women to come. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very sorry, but I, I did miss some names. I didn't scroll down all the way. This uh, something happened with my spreadsheet. So I have Marika. Marika, there you are. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'm very honored to speak here today. Um, I had a long letter sort of describing my relationship to Fearless Girl, but um, I'm an architect. I worked at DSR for 10 years. I teach at Pratt, I teach at CUNY. Uh, I'm an artist, I was a ballet dancer, uh, and I currently have my own architecture practice. I was lucky enough to work on the broken glass ceiling around Fearless Girl. I think what I'd like to offer, my letter um, that I submitted was more about my relationship to the sculpture and how important she is um, and how she sort of transcends ownership. She transcends the people that created her. I think after listening to all this testimony, I'd just like to offer a little bit of like a second um, an outsider's perspective, I guess. When I worked with McCann and State Street Group on this project, a creative team had come up with the idea before I worked on her. Um, and I think it's important to not demonize um, the private sector in this case, or the fact that this project started as an advertisement. I 100% believe that it's grown out of the fact that it was an advertisement and the fact that it was sponsored by a private corporation. Um, but I do think it's important maybe in this conversation to just recognize that the creation of this project is beyond a single artist, in my opinion. And um, it takes both a benefactor, it takes a creative energy, so this creative uh, agency, which is McCann, who thought of her, thought about where to place her, um, found someone to sponsor her. The intricacies and the delicacy of her creation is complicated. It's gray. Um, who owns her now is also complicated. And I um, just think that, I know it's probably beyond the Design Commission's responsibility. I do believe making her temporarily longer extended, like keeping her around is maybe a great solution <clears throat> to the problem. But I would just recognize, I just want the public to also know that her story is complicated. And I think she's be, she lives beyond in one artist. Um, and I think maybe in, sorry, this is not written out because it's all ad lib now, but um, I, I think the last thing I would just say is, um, her permanence is, is, would be really, really great. Um, 
And I think her temporary permanence is equally as great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did we have Laura Tenenbaum? Rebecca? Yes. If okay. You could have Laura, Laura, Let's have Laura go. Accept the request to unmute. I already spoke. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. We have a lot of duplicate names on here. It's hard to keep. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and Michelle Scott <clears throat> does not appear to be on the line. Okay. Cynthia De Bartolo. Cynthia, if you could accept. Yes, I'm us. muted. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today before the Public Design Commission of the City of New York. Um, I will be limiting my comments around the situs of the statue. And while I commend the very talented, gifted artist, Kristen, um, I will refrain from comments that I am unaware of, of the legal issues surrounding um, her particular um, um, uh, challenges with uh, State Street or anybody else. So with that, I respectfully submit this letter as CEO of Tigris Financial Partners in support of the Fearless Girl Permit. Did you know that in the 10 years between 2000 and 2010 alone, 141,000 women or 2.6% of the female workforce in finance disappeared for the from the financial services industry? while the ranks of men ballooned up to 389,000 or 9.6%. This according to the uh, data provided by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics at the end of 2010. Each of these 141,000 women has a personal story, why they went to Wall Street, what it took to stay there and why they left. Here's mine. I began my career in on Wall Street 1984, working for global banks like Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, Smith Barney, and Citigroup. And in 2009, in the prime of my career, I was diagnosed with advanced head and neck cancer. The primary site was my tongue. It was a catastrophic diagnosis that not only took away my tongue, but it ended my 25 year career in the industry. It was a time that when I, dis when I discovered Wall Street was at hard for a woman, but now it was seemingly impossible for a disabled woman who was dependent upon speaking with a tongue that was reconstructed two years later from both my arms. After being told my disability was too difficult to accommodate, I realized the magnitude of challenges faced by both women and disabled individuals for centuries who are marginalized in the financial services industry. So I decided to take my decades of experience on Wall Street, my education, and my federal securities attorney experience and tenacity applied to FINRA and the SEC to form the nation's first disabled and woman-owned investment bank, broker, dealer, and research provider. And in 2011, against all odds, I was awarded the coveted licenses from the regulators and named my firm Tigress financial partners. It means fierce woman. Since that time, my firm has grown from four people to a workforce of 65, 85% of which are comprised of women, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, and disabled individuals. In July of 2021, Tigress made history, becoming the first disabled and woman-owned floor broker and member of the New York Stock Exchange in the big board's 229-year history. The current site is a fearless girl in front of the New York Stock Exchange represents the fierce resilience it took for me and my incredible team to achieve these milestones. In addition, fearless girls have a clear message that if companies want to compete in a global marketplace, then diversity, inclusion, and equality of opportunity are critical. Moreover, this 50 inch statue has impact that surpasses its physical size. It is a call to action for corporate America to provide a voice for women from the board level to the C-suite level to management. Fearless Girl is a beacon of hope for equality, empowerment and resilience at a time and in a place where there is still much work to be done. 
we respectfully request that on April 11, 2022, that the Honorable Public Design Commission grant the three-year temporary permit for the Fearless Girl statue to remain in front of the world's largest global stock exchange because her symbolism that every woman, regardless of their age, ethnicity, religion, or sexuality, is a formidable force and has a leading role in their own unique, inspiring, and unfolding Thank life you. story. That is important as the stock exchange Thank itself. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Pill, she's next. Hi, uh, I'm Sasha Pilch, co-founder of NYC FinTech Women, an organization of 8,000 members that supports women's advancement in their careers. The Fearless Girl represents every single woman in NYC, and in particular, women in financial services and in tech, who have fought hard for their place at the table. Her current location in front of the New York Stock Exchange is symbolic, inspiring, and important, especially because of how women have had to fight for their careers. Not only does the Fearless Girl impress the women of New York City and our visitors, but she reminds all genders that women deserve a seat at the table. I ask that you not only renew the permit, but also give her a permanent one. Thank you. Thank you, Diana Spatash. Hi, my name is Diana Sweet. I am Director of Planning and Land Use at Manhattan Community Board One. Last week, CB1 sent a letter to PDC asking for action on this application to be delayed until the board has a chance to review and opine. The CB1 Landmarks and Preservation Committee received a presentation on this proposal in October 2021 as part of approval for renewal of the Landmarks Preservation Commission permit. At that time, concerns were raised among board members and from the public about the nature of the statue, the relationship of the artist to this application, the allowances surrounding the application as a private corporate campaign, whether it is considered an advertisement or public art and whether that is appropriate for placement in a public space. There were also many questions but little clarity about public oversight and approvals up to that point. The resounding sentiment of the board at that time was that the members did not feel like they had enough information or clarity on the application and its status among the approvals process at that time to opine, and in fact that members were likely to support the application as long as there was assurance that the full scope of public review was undertaken, including review by PDC. The expectation at that time was that the board would have an opportunity to engage and opine during the PDC review process. Unfortunately, after repeated invitations from CB1, the applicants declined to return to present on the PDC application and said that they did not need to return because they presented to CB1 as part of the LPC approval process. As such, CB1 does not have a formal opinion to report at this stage of review. CB1 is disappointed that this major step in the public engagement process is being skipped now that review is underway, and there are larger concerns about the precedent this sets for other applicants in sending a message that it is acceptable to sidestep community board and public engagement. As a representative of a community board, our obligation is to ensure that the public review process is protected and that the standard of scrutiny surrounding placement of art in a public space is maintained. Thank you. Thank you. I see we, I'm sorry, Kathy Cohen, we had accidentally, we didn't, we didn't have your full name. Okay, we have you now. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Yes, uh, I am just uh, wanting to express my support for the artist, Kristen Visible. She created something important. And I don't think I really need to repeat uh, what others have said here. I think I just represent probably millions of others across the globe who feel similarly and who have, I've been impressed with the work. It has moved me and I believe that um, Kristen's uh, wishes should be um, respected and honored. Thank you. Thank you. Edward Amod, I'm oh, sorry, Amador. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here on behalf of Councilmember Gail Brewer, who wanted to be here herself, but she's chairing a hearing, so she asked me to read remarks into the record. 
Um, she says, Dear President Nielsen, I want to reiterate my support for the Fearless Girl statue located at Broad Street within the historic financial district. The applicant, State Street, is seeking an extension of the Preservation Divine Design Commission permit, facilitating a three-year temporary installation of the statue. As Manhattan Borough President, I testified in support of this proposal at the December 2021 Landmarks Preservation Committee public hearing. Um, I'll go on to close up. I firmly support the extension of the three-year Preservation Design Committee permit. The statue deserves to be preserved at its present location. It is not yet a historical landmark, however, it has historical significance. The sculptor intended the work to represent a time of significant change in a historical representation of the relationship between images of cultural dominance and the issue of gender equality confronting these forces. Shortly after its installation, the statue became a, a symbol for the women's movement and has been admired by tourists and New York City residents alike. According to State Street, since the installation of the statue, 1,486 companies were identified for not having a woman on their board. And as of February 2021, 862 of these companies have added a female director. It is widely recognized that the site of the fearless girl encourages women to follow their dreams, regardless of their age, orientation, or race. The statue's presence in the historic financial district is a fitting site for one of the city's most important contemporary symbolic works of art. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of this application. Councilmember Gail Brewer, six, District 6. Thank you. Thank you. Lena uh, Gottesman. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Lena Gottesman. I own Altus Metal and Marble and Wood. We have been maintaining the patina on the fearless girl since she was uh, installed near the bull. Um, I also have been representing many, many groups of women throughout the last 30 some odd years that I've been in business. I am a certified woman owned business. And I can tell you that every organization, the Women's President's Organization, the New York Women's Chamber of Commerce, where I am the chair, uh, I could go on and on about organizations I've participated in. All the women feel very strongly that the fearless girl must stay. Um, depending on how you work it out, I don't think we care that much. We just want her to remain where she is. Being on Wall Street, is an ideal location. It symbolizes the strength and financial success that women have been looking for and moving up toward. And again, trying to get on corporate boards are so important for the future of women. And we strongly, I strongly uh, support the um, fearless girl remaining exactly where she is as a tremendous symbol. And if you ever walk by her, you will see dozens of young girls and women waiting to take a picture with her, including myself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Taina Prado. Sorry if that's not the right pronunciation. It's can... very close. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Hi. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, my name is Tina Prada. I'm chief of staff at the Downtown Alliance. I'm reading a letter um, on behalf of our president, Jessica Lappin, who was unfortunately unable to attend the hearing today. I am writing to express the Downtown Alliance's strong support of State Street's application to give the Phyllis Girl statue a permanent home in Lower Manhattan. Downtown Alliance is the business improvement district for the area roughly from City Hall to the Battery from East River to West Street. We strive to make Lower Manhattan a wonderful place to live, work, and play by creating a vibrant neighborhood for businesses, residents, and tourists alike. We treasure our downtown icons, the Charging Bull, Federal Hall, Francis Tavern, and Trinity Church, to name a few. The Fearless Girl statue has joined the ranks of those powerful local landmarks since her initial installation in March of 2017. As an important citizen of our downtown neighborhood, she shines a light from Wall Street to the world on the importance of elevating women's status in our lives from corporate leadership positions to sports to educational opportunities. Her image has been invoked as an inspiration and reminder that the women's bravery, that women's bravery is the leading edge of progress and her presence near the New York Stock Exchange is particularly potent in this regard. Report and after report has noted the the deleterious effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on working women as more and more women have taken a step back from the workforce or dropped out altogether. 
For this girl stands in defiance of the barriers, old and new, that have hindered women from taking their rightful spots at the top. And we hope she continues to serve as an inspiration to prospective glass ceiling shatterers for years to come. On behalf of the Downtown Alliance Board of Directors, I strongly encourage you to support this application to permit the Fearless Girl a permanent home, a permanent home downtown. Jessica Lappin, president of the Downtown Alliance. Thank you. We have Meredith Mascara. Thank you, Meredith Mascara, proud CEO of Girl Scouts of Greater New York. Uh, no stranger to the PDC, as I was a board member of Monumental Women and uh, Girl Scouts were a supporter of the first statue of real women in Central Park, hoping for the day when uh, representation and art and statues across the city no longer is about making precedent, but becomes a precedent. Uh, the Fearless Girl represents the individual power within every girl. And as the largest leadership program for girls in New York City, this statue holds a very special place in our hearts. It is also steps away from the entrance to our offices, where our girls get to see her and participate and do activities with her um, all, all the time throughout their year. Seeing her stand so strong before one of the well-known landmarks uh, in New York City is, is a historically male-dominated institution. It reminds our girls in this city and women all over that we have the ability to make the world a better place through our leadership. I want the 25,000 girls in the five boroughs of New York City that I serve and the millions of girls who visit each year to see fearless girls courage and think of their own. As you walk around the city, we know that there are only five out of 150 statues of historic figures depicted of women. Now we talk about real women, but we know in the, uh, in the incredible book, uh, The Velveteen Rabbit, I will tell you that the fearless girl has become real. <laughs> History has long overlooked the accomplishments of women and girls, and it is time to change the narrative for this next generation. The statue's placement in front of the stock exchange particularly resonates because we want to feel that girls belong in financial centers. Business and entrepreneurship, STEM and leadership development are the key components of the Girl Scout leadership experience. And we see how this statue makes a real difference when they see themselves represented in that space and in the fields and in positions of influence every day. We are working for our long-term vision to create a New York City in which every girl feels empowered to lead in her workplace, the community, and the world. The fearless girl represents that vision and reminds girls what they are capable of. We hope she will continue to share that message in her current home for years to come. So we fully support the three year. However, I have no doubts that there will be thousands of girls who will be advocating for fearless girl to become a permanent resident in our neighborhood downtown. Thank you for letting me testify today. Thank you. I think that's the end of the testimony. We've gone through the list and no one. Okay. All right. Um, Signe, I think we can move forward. Wonderful. Um, thank you, uh, members of the public who um, spoke today. Uh, many of you with great passion. Um, I would like to uh, see if there are any questions or comments um, from our uh, commissioners. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, Hi. I'm Mary Valverde, one of the commissioners. Um, I'm not in favor of the use of public property for branding or marketing uh, purposes for private corporations. Um, Real, real representation is a major issue in our society, which is different from actual equity in the workplace and academia and the rest of our society with real decision-making uh, power and ownership. Um, the art, this artwork brings um, the question of artist copyright and ownership and residual rights to artists, perhaps a longer conversation with um, policies to support visual artists, um, to unionize and actually support artists' designs and reproductions and their legacy in the States. Um, we should consider the fact that the reason that uh, film and television industries are so successful in New York City is because they have SAG, AFTRA, and um, that exists in other unions as well. But in the meantime, perhaps the artists can consider following 
the proper steps and channels um, and um, partner with uh, the agency for Center for Art to help assist them um, and advocate for them to the best possible solutions. Um, the PDC does not set, um, should not set any precedent accepting work that has not been reviewed by the Percent for Art um, program, but um, as a visual artist, I sympathize with uh, Kristen and um, I hope that she follows up with Percent for Art and then, and some, and that this could be tabled so that we can review and um, see what comes legally uh, to this to some point. Um, and I would love to hear what the other design commissioners have to say. Thank you, Mary. Ethel? Uh, thank you. Um, I, uh, again, uh, one of my fellow commissioners has uh, raised points more eloquently than I will, but I want to say a couple of things. First, that I was enormously moved by the various statements uh, from many women and some men and others and even around the world. Uh, about the issues, uh, the long-term issues and the opportunity both with pandemic and worse, perhaps to change some of the inequalities that we are all experiencing. But I, uh, there are a couple of questions which I had from the beginning. And that is, I heard the artist first of all, and she, it seemed to me, felt that she had no um, there was no control uh, over her work, that it was uh, that there was no relationship, I think, between those uh, sponsoring this, um, citing this, and her own work. And I immediately wondered, wait a minute, is this being donated? Where is the artist? What is the process, especially in terms of her own copyright and her own collaboration as she ex hoped to engage in and said that she has been ignored. That seemed extremely uh, uh, peculiar to me and I hope that I wasn't understanding that correctly. The second thing uh, clearly is the question in my mind because of the lack of clarity uh, of the so-called sponsor, the commercial sponsors, State Street, whoever they are, and the overtones, and I think often the explicit uh, a question and need for a kind of commercial sponsorship. And I, I, I'm not I, uh, I hope I'm echoing Mary uh, uh, with the questions about uh, this kind of ad uh, the need for sponsorship of this kind. I know that um, art uh, often needs sponsorship, but this is all too unclear and it seems to me questionable. The third thing is that again, I heard from the district manager of Ward 1. I don't know if they're, they're not asleep at the switch, but I mean, not at all. But if they have, they, they say that they have many important questions. They did not have the opportunity uh, to present those questions to the Public Design Commission. Now, the Public Design Commission now is being asked for the extension of a temporary exhibit, not for the permanent. But every one of these points, if there's any accuracy in anything that has been said, need clarification. Thank you, Ethel. Um, would anyone else like to uh, make a comment? I have a feeling yes. it's going to be rather challenging to. Uh, put together a, um, <clears throat> a something to vote on here. So uh, I'm Signe, welcome uh, comment. Yes. I also thought it might be helpful to to hear from DOT in terms of the the temporary art program and permanent art installations in their in their uh, per, under their purview. Oh, absolutely. Um, yes. Nick, can you clarify uh, that? Yes. Can you all hear me? Sorry. Yes. Good? Okay, cool. Hi, uh, this is Nick Petnati. Uh, I'm Deputy Director for Urban Design and the uh, liaison to the Public Design Commission for DOT. Um, uh, so I, I guess I will start off by clarifying the, the agency has uh, two paths uh, in terms of artwork. 
We have a very robust temporary art program that the commission is fairly familiar with. Uh, there are a number of tracks that uh, we uh, offer to accommodate uh, various types of artworks in various sites uh, across our jurisdiction. Again, we uh, are in charge of the city's streets, bridges, sidewalks. Uh, for members of the public, we don't deal with the subway. That's not us. Um, and then we partner with the Department of Cultural Affairs and their Percent for Art program uh, on the implementation of any permanent pieces that are in our collection. We have a very small permanent collection compared to some of our sister agencies. Uh, and we only uh, pursue artwork through that percent for our process associated with uh, other capital projects. Uh, so we, again, don't uh, accept gifts of permanent artwork. This is uh, something that has obviously come up in the testimony. Uh, I do want to be very clear on that point. Um, I will also say that, uh, and just a, a minor correction, this uh, initial installation of Fearless Girl actually started out as a street activity permit office uh, event. And then uh, State Street did work with us to uh, uh, pursue the temporary art program and the rest of the process uh, as Sarah had laid out. So this is definitely a, a unique circumstance uh, in, in terms of, of how it has played out. Uh, but that is uh, at least the fundamentals of, of how we as an agency deal with artworks that are proposed uh, for display in the city right of way. Uh, and obviously happy to, to get into any more specifics uh, if there are questions from the commission. Thank you, Nick. Deborah? Thank you, Signe. Um, I think it's clear that Fearless Girl has outgrown her origin as a promotion for a new fund by a private corporation. And we need to, as commissioners, hear the very passionate testimony from so many about what she means to them today. But respect for women has to start with respect for women artists. And um, uh, I encourage all of those on the side of state uh, from the uh, proposal to others who are from the finance industry to uh, publicize the percentage of women who are in leadership in the industry to encourage more women to be on boards, to support pay equality, to provide child care in the office, the things that would be meaningful steps within their industry. And I would propose that we, uh, given as, as my fellow commissioners have pointed out that the process by which Fearless Girl came to be in the public realm was not consonant with uh, uh, the proper processes of how public art comes into the public realm, that I propose that we either um, uh, table this extension and ask that the city um, engage directly with the artist and, and discuss with her her offer to uh, uh, gift this to the city or that we make a shorter extension uh, pending such a conversation with the city. I second. Yes, I was actually thinking, um, I mean, <clears throat> this is clearly uh, a situation that we do not wanna kick this can down the road. And for those people who said that, you know, this would be a every three years, we would have to tackle this uh, again, seems ridiculous. I was uh, deeply um, moved by the people who said that if we uh, are not able to arrive at a permanent resolution, then this piece of art or this work, uh, you know, remains vulnerable. Uh, and that that is in and of itself unsettling. So I feel uh, moved by both of those points of view. Um, what I am understanding uh, is that uh, number one, we today, the Public Design Commission cannot make this a permanent piece of art. That is not before us and we cannot uh, uh, undertake that as a vote. We can, urge uh, that uh, steps be taken uh, to enable this work to be considered for the public collection. It would appear from what I just heard from Nick Pedinati is that the DOT does not accept 
donations. So it would appear potentially that uh, the, the artist would need to work through the percent for art. Now, I'm only familiar with percent for art when it's associated with a capital project. So I am not exactly clear uh, whether if we were to suggest, I don't want to put the artist in an untenable position. I, I believe that for the most part, uh, uh, we on the design commission would like to see this process normalized um, and that we don't just keep giving this some kind of uh, temporary approval that, that sort of goes on and becomes its own uh, really kind of out of control, ir um, unregular, uh, uh, uncontrolled and, and not monitored process. So I am actually uh, thinking of something and I'm gonna need some help here, Carrie, please. Um, we would, uh, I would like to propose that we uh, issue uh, a temporary extension of the permit as is being requested, not necessarily for three years, but a duration of time that essentially requires the players that we have heard from today uh, to uh, arrive at a solution uh, where this work can be considered uh, for the a public, permanent public uh, installation. Carrie, is it possible that the Percent for Art program uh, does accept, uh, or is there another entity that can accept a public donation with whom the artist and others can collaborate? Well, it seems that from what DOT has said, it might need to be a different city agency uh, that this goes through. So a different um, city agency's property uh, could also be uh, uh, private property. Maybe it's on a POPs or maybe it's on state property. I mean, there are a lot of different opportunities uh, that you know could be pursued. Um, percent for art, the percent for art process is tied to a capital project. So you cannot have a percent for art um, project that isn't, that's sort of standing alone. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we, you know, there are, you know, I'm sure that the city, you know, city agencies would be willing to look into the process and what's possible. Uh, I don't know what's uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps there is a capital project in the pipeline. Um, you know, I, um, well, there has been some yeah. discussion about uh, repaving Broad Street, and there has been some discussion about some significant capital improvements in the public realm. Uh -huh. So we should, um, I guess, what where I'm where I'm going is, how do we how do we move forward here to enable the piece to remain in the public realm, which seems to be the overriding um, request in addition to advancing a process where the artist um, uh, is able to uh, uh, regain control over, over her piece and, um, and that it become, uh, or that it be considered through the, through the normal uh, process by which we mm -hmm. review uh, public art. That seems to me to be the, the three issues mm -hmm. on the table. Yeah, well, I cannot, I can't speak for Percent for Art, but I, I do know that there typically is, um, through the Percent for Art process, there's typically two panels and you select a group of artists, they come up with proposals and then you select the, a proposal. So it is true that the city very rarely accepts gifts of existing artworks into the city's collection. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's never happened, um, but, you know, it is rare. And um, so, you know, I think it would just be getting creative. I, I you know, I, I acknowledge there are lawsuits and, you know, that's not really our purview. And I, I feel like we can't, we're not a court of law. We can't get into um, deciding who owns copyright, who owns trademark, any of that. And 
you know, I think that it's all very unfortunate that that's, that that's part of the story. Um, Carrie, excuse me for one second. Wasn't the sure. women's statue in Central Park a donation by a private foundation? It was, but it went through a panel. So there was, uh, the city required them to mimic the percent for art panel. So uh, there were um, a group of professionals who chose a short list of artists and those artists created, excuse me, proposals that were uh, reviewed by the panel and chosen. But it was a donation of a private Entity. But not of an existing work of art, correct? Well, maybe something that um, uh, Kristen should consider is uh, a variation of the original, um, something very close or something to the same effect that she could, it could be a new work that she's proposing mm -hmm. with public with present for art. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I think that the commission can approve the approve the uh, temporary existing installation for less than three years, if you would like to. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't know if um, you want to hear, Sarah, I see Sarah has their hand raised. I don't know if you want to hear. She can speak specifically to the issue of time. Then I would okay. be interested in hearing. Because I'm, I, I, it, on the one hand, I want to, I want to hold people's feet to the fire mm -hmm. um, to resolve this and not let it get tangled up in lawsuits that are really have nothing to do with this piece of art in New York City's public realm. Um, it yes has other things to do with with um, obviously the artist's rights, um, uh, but. I, I, want to, I, I want to try to not kick the can down the road so that if one year from now there isn't a resolution, that this is not again before us for another temporary uh, permit. Sarah, can you speak to time? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to respond. First, I just wanted to say it, it's great to hear that so many people feel passionate about Fearless Girl. Her mission is clearly doing its job. I think we can all see that the statue's message has gone further than State Street originally planned for or anticipated, and we're so thankful for the support I got for Fearless Girl. As noted, a lot of people have brought up the idea of permanency. State Street would be open to the idea of keeping Fearless Girl in front of the stock exchange longer term, and we're very willing to discuss that with the city and any agencies needed. Um, we were advised by the DOT, PDC, and the LPC to ask for a temporary permit. Uh, and we had always been advised that gifts of public art were, were very rarely accepted. Um, it does seem, as, as you're starting to say, I, I think the best, pass, best path forward would be to proceed with what we've been advised in our application at hand before conversations about permanency are initiated. Um, you know, we're open to whatever time frame you feel is appropriate to vote on, on our application today. And then, you know, additional conversations can, can occur after that. Okay, thank you. Yes, I am, <clears throat> I am completely without um, a sense of what is realistic here. And I think the reason um, and even though Carrie said we're not supposed to get um, tangled up in the lawsuit aspect of it, I suspect that that is going to be part of it uh, in terms of the final negotiation and that uh, how we extricate uh, this process from that process I, uh, is, is really beyond me. Um, I suppose the other scenario uh, is to do what was suggested by Commissioner Valverde, which is to table it. Uh, until such time uh, as there is greater clarity. Uh, I believe uh, Commissioner Sheffer has said the same thing uh, with, with regard to the community board process. Uh, and um, that may be uh, the, the best course of action uh, because I, I personally do not feel qualified uh, to be able to put a proposition before these commissioners that, that I, uh, can can feel that I can stand behind. Yes, Ethel. Um, yes, thanks. I, I don't want to, uh, you know, just shove it to, to some unknown uh, time, but I do feel, and as you've outlined, that there are a number of questions that we uh, need some clarification on, and it might help 
if we table and provide a shorter period of time, is six months too short? I don't want to go to a year or two because it's punting too long, but I just feel that there's more information that we need, which we could identify now as part of our tabling and make a time frame that is doable uh, to answer some, uh, some of those questions or a number of them. I would agree. I mean, one thing that, that I, I feel would uh, uh, be potentially appropriate would be to say 11 months. Um, because that is the criteria uh, under which a, a work of art is not permanent. Um, and okay. yeah. I believe that we, um, uh, a number of commissioners uh, are, are not willing to uh, uh, have our decision construed as an acceptance of this as yes. a piece of permanent art. Yes. Um, and I think that's important that we uphold that. Um, I do believe that there are a number of questions which I think uh, we can articulate to the applicants. Um, uh, so um, thank you, Ethel. I'm going to make a proposition. I'm going to put a proposal before us to uh, grant a uh, 11 month temporary uh, permit for the fearless girl to remain in its current location uh, with the um, uh, urging that the parties uh, work together uh, to uh, devise a strategy, site proposals, whatever you're able to do uh, to come back to the uh, design commission with a, with a permanent uh, location. And I also want to say that uh, it is important to recognize that, that if this 11-month uh, uh, permit is uh, uh, approved by the majority of the commission, that this is not to be uh, construed as us accepting a, a badly broken process that got us to the place that we're in right now. And number two, that, that we are not uh, sanctioning this de facto as a piece of public art. Um, so if anyone, uh, I'm going I would to second that if you are making that as a motion. Thank you. Uh, I would second it, Sydney, but I, I would ask that it be six months. Okay. Yeah. I would okay. ask that it be six months and I really want to support this artist. And I really want to support all the other views of yourself, Deborah, Mary, Ethel, who spoke specifically to the fact that they want to support women. And this sculpture speaks to supporting women and the first woman that it needs to be in respect of, as Deborah so rightly said, is the artist herself who is present. And I don't think we can walk over that. So in six months, we need to see that. Yes, I agree with um, everyone. Also, just wanted to make note that it, um, with respect to the artists, that we as a PDC and the city agencies should really consider any any future rules or policies that would um, just allow the uh, ownership of uh, original artworks from art from their artists and that they may remain the owners, even um, designers and have the rights to the artworks in, um, in perpetuity, especially and um, if it's on city owned property and land, um, despite any corporate uh, support. I second you, Mary. Yes, thank you, thank you Mary. Yeah. All right, so the, uh, the proposal before us is to grant Fearless Girl, a six month temporary permit to remain in its current location while um, uh, a resolution is arrived at uh, for um, a permanent home and a fair um, uh, treatment of the artist. Commissioners, I, I just wanna clarify, I mean, <laughs> the city 
unfortunately does work really slow. Um, I have reviewed many capital projects over the last 16 years and they typically um, are a long time in the making. And I, you know, six months is a, a very short time for a capital process. So if, for example, if the city were to try to, for example, try to identify upcoming capital projects that could be, that this could be kind of identified with that, you know, a lot of those projects are going to be going into the pipeline toward the end of the year. I, I mean, I don't know if Nick, you might well, have more insight into that. Suggestion. Yeah. Um, can we I, hear from Nick? I'm sorry. I just want to, I, it, yeah. Um, go ahead. Nick. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Carrie, I think you're very much on point. Um, I, I don't think that we would have any issue in, in working with State Street, the, the, the artists, the applicants that come back and, and uh, brief staff or brief the commission in six months time. But I do think process wise to arrive at a decision in terms of uh, either adjusting city policy in terms of uh, accepting gifts of art, finding capital projects, like there's a lot of complex pieces here that go way above my pay grade, certainly. <laughs> Um, so I, I do wonder just in terms of the time frame, uh, I, I don't think that there's any issue in, in holding uh, you know, us to account and coming back and, and telling the you know, staff, the full commissioners, where we're at, what those discussions are, but to, to be able to make a final decision on some of that stuff, uh, timing is, is tough. Six months is very short. So I, I don't know how that balance is. Actually, no, Nick, that, makes, that makes that makes sense to me that you, you come back to us in six months, right. with your ducks in a row. And then we can talk about whether or not you need any more time. But if it's what it is now, how can I say I'm an ally to women when I'm supporting a, sim a symbol to support women that has insulted the woman who made it? I cannot do that. So six months, handle the business, and then we have more time to do anything else. Sounds I good. I agree. OK. Uh, 11 month uh, temporary permit with uh, the requirement that within six months there be uh, a, a substantive uh, process in place uh, to uh, resolve the, uh, the way in which this uh, uh, piece of work is going to be adjudicated, placed, honored, and attributed uh, to the uh, artist. Uh, if that is clear, and if anyone wants to add some more uh, so that it, it is uh, more in keeping with your uh, opinion, um, we will take a vote uh, to approve, reject, or table that motion. Um, Phil Ahrens. Uh-oh, did we lose him? Mm, yeah. Yes, Phil. Well. Yeah. I totally approve. Thank you. Ken Seth Armstead. Approve as stipulated. Karen Keel. Lori Hawkinson has left us, by the way. Uh, Karen Keel. Table. Table. Deborah Martin. Um, I approve, Signe, as you've described uh, the conditions, but I would add that I would urge DOT and the other agencies that have purview over the public realm to develop more clarity on their policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, works placed in the public realm without having gone through the proper process, that I would urge them to not allow such works to stay in the public realm and develop the kind of um, uh, public that this work has developed before it, 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 it goes through the proper process because there can be works that aren't as felicitous as Fearless Girl and that's just we have to be mindful that we're not just one company or one street we're a whole city so I would add that that recommendation. Thank you. Um, Susan Morgenthau. Approved. Ethel Sheffer. Approved with the last point of Deborah. Thank you. Meryl Tisch. I approve and I, I wanna say, I think everyone has been 
remarkably reasonable and thoughtful here, but I'm not surprised. Thank you, Meryl. <laughs> uh, Mary Valverde? Approve with uh, Sydney's and Deborah's notes. All right, and myself approve. So it is, uh, uh, it is a majority in favor of approving uh, with one uh, vote for tabling. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and thank you again to the public for your passion on this subject. Good day. Thank you. Thank you, Signe. Thank you, commissioners. You don't want to do any more? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's have another.